Hit it. It's October 2nd, 2020, episode 99. I'm Patrick Serezna. And I'm Kevin Muir. This week, we welcome to the show Ronnie Sturfele from Incrementum Management. We discuss gold, inflation, and the intricacies of Austrian soccer. Then Harris joins us for Cuppy's Corner, where he tells us about his new largest position. In this week in trading history, we go back to the 2008 TARP bailout for the WTF Clip of the Week T- Tesla Bulls Go Super Trooper. And we then get to our new segments of No Stupid Questions and Skin in the Game. And Kevin, we might even drink some beers along the way. So stick around, everyone. We've got a great show. Lena, hop on. What beer are we drinking this week? This week's beer is Left Field Brewing Company's Ephus Oatmeal Brown Ale. Ooh, bro- <laughs> oatmeal. Bro- yeah. It's like it's like breakfast beer. Yeah, it's, I, I'm full just by looking at it. Um, so it says here, our oatmeal brown ale is inspired by the seldom thrown ephus, a risky mm. and unexpected high arcing pitch that catches the batter off guard. This American brown ale finds its sweet spot with aromas of roasted malts, toasted nuts, a touch of bitterness, and a surprisingly creamy, smooth taste. A and- touch of bitterness. <laughs> this would go great with a pulled pork sandwich yeah. <laughs> oh my god this is uh, okay i gotta stop i gotta keep quiet <laughs> all right let's get let's all right give us our disclaimer kev nothing in this podcast should be viewed as investment advice listeners should consult an investment professional before making any decisions regarding topics mentioned in this show side effects of too much huddle may include johnson and johnson johnson the airline queasies and the house bound by the Democrats. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Let's get a tautological humor today. Okay. Let's, let's get to our first interview. It's with great pleasure that I get to welcome somebody that I've been looking forward to meeting for some time now, Ronnie Stouffer-Lay from Incrementum uh, Management, Money Management. Welcome, Ron. Hi. Thank you very Thank much for, for having me, gentlemen. It's been just a pleasure. I've been reading your book, which I call the Holy Bible of the Gold Market. That's the politically gold- not correct. I- <laughs> it's not only the Bible. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's a great read. It's huge. Is it like a hundred pages every year? No, no, it's three hundred fifty pages. Oh yeah, geez, I'm every selling year you short. We, we 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 try to write less. Uh, this year, the compact <laughs> version was 100 pages. <laughs> and most people say we need a compact version of the compact version. Um, <laughs> but there's just quite a lot of stuff to write these days. It, it, it's a terrific read. And for those who are interested, make sure you sign up for our newsletter because you will be getting a link or uh, we'll list it in the, the show notes uh, on the bottom of the uh, YouTube th- uh, page. Anyways, let's get to it. But before we do, let us I'd love to learn a little bit more about yourself, Ronnie. Um, sure. You know, you're you're from another part of the world, something that uh, us North Americans aren't exposed to very often. You grew up in, what, uh, Vienna? And Vienna, uh, yes. even though you were in Vienna, it didn't stop you from uh, trading stocks like uh, any other North American young child. Like, I, I, you started young, right? Yeah, well, I, I bought my first stocks when I was like 13. And and I did really well, with, which was a blessing or, or perhaps also a curse. Uh, and <laughs> I, I remember the, the dot-com boom and I even better remember the dot-com bust. Um, I remember a, a company called adultshop.com. Um, yeah. It was a basically <laughs> Australian shell, uh, a, a mining company where they put in a, a, an online sex shop. And <laughs> when they IPO'd, the stock was up 600%. And, you know, it was just, just normal back then. Um, <laughs> what, did your folk, what did your folks think about you buying an online sex shop? <laughs> well, actually, the funny thing is uh, my, my, basically the whole class, um, they, they kind of found out that I'm make, making tons of money on the stock market. So basically 50% of, of, of my schoolmates, they, they owned this adultshop.com and afterwards travelshop.com. That was, the, <laughs> that was <laughs> the beginning of the end. But it was crazy times and, and I didn't have any clue about, you know, um, uh, about uh, uh, global macro, you know, how, how interest rates, of course, affect um, stock market prices. Um, and I, I, I learned that uh, during the dot-com bust. Um, yeah, but 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 I think it was a it was a very valuable uh, time for me, and 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 I hope that I learned quite a lot from it. 
Right. So from there, you go in off to university and you what? You studied finance? Where did you go to university? Yeah, I studied finance and economics uh, over here in Vienna. I always worked part time next to my studies, so so I worked for a um, basically a financial newspaper over here, and uh, afterwards I I worked part time at a trading desk uh, in a big bank uh, trading credit derivatives. Um, I did a semester abroad in in, in the states, uh, University of Illinois, which was um, quite a fun time, and. And then I started working um, at Erste Group in Vienna, which is a, a really big savings bank. It's it's around for um, 130 years now, and and I started uh, analyzing Asian equities. Okay. But I, I was also invested in a privately in a in uh, a junior mining company called Osisco Mining or, or Osisco oh. Exploration back then. It's a, it's a good Canadian name. Yeah, and that was a forty bagger, and so I went to my boss and said, you know, can I can I write about gold? I I I got this fantastic investment. I don't don't have any clue about gold, and and he said, yeah, go ahead. So so I started basically reading everything about gold. I I started understanding our monetary system because nobody really teaches you, um, you know, uh, how our monetary system works, how money is created. And and then from from then on, 2007, every year I wrote a In Gold We Trust report. And now it is the most widely followed publication about gold. It's published in German, English, and in Mandarin. And we had roughly two million readers for the last edition, so it's it's really oh, a big thing smokes. nowadays. Yeah. I now I would have thought being Austrian, <laughs> this is something that they imprint in you in like grade school. <laughs> <laughs> no, you don't. You don't learn about gold and hard money in in grade school. Uh, n- n- not really. Not no? really. Um, I, I, but I think it's you know it's 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 interesting because um, I I I tend to say that we've got gold in our monetary DNA because you yeah. know of our history. Um, if you talk to the generation of my grandparents, um, they for, for them gold is just a monetary insurance because they lost everything twice or even three times. Uh, um, so so over here in in Austria, but also in Germany, I think. We are still heavily influenced by the hyperinflation and 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 the currency reforms, and I think that to to some degree that that also has an influence on uh, on central bank policy because over here I think uh, or it used to be like that um, the ECB was more more concerned about uh, uh, inflation because of this kind of Germanic influence, while I think the Federal Reserve has always been more concerned with with deflation because of the Great Depression. So, um, but that, of course, I mean, now everything is <laughs> is, is, is different, and everybody is an inflationist. Um, but it is, I think, gold over here having physical gold that is something pretty normal. You get it for Christmas, you get it for birthdays. Um, it is something that um, you can, for example, if you go if you go to to a normal branch of a bank, you can buy gold coins. I think that's that's pretty. Um, pretty uncommon in, in, in North America. For sure. Um, so, so you brought a great package here. Why don't we dive in here? And uh, I, I love the first quote that you, you, you quote Carol so- Sokoloff, and he says yeah. that all, re- all roads lead to gold. And let's jump in here and you, you show the first chart is the c- central bank flows year over year. What, do, what are you trying to show here? Well, I mean, uh, it's, 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 I mean, you, you guys, you know it best, and 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 I think it's uh, what we're living through here is 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 really, really unprecedented. Although you know the word unprecedented is is almost used uh, hyperinflationary, but but you can see um, first of all a very strong correlation between uh, central bank flows, um, but you can also see that um, the 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 rate of change. For central bank balance sheet growth for for the ECB, the Bank of Japan, and and the Federal Reserve, uh, is really staggering. And 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 we we saw it, I think, over the last couple of weeks, when when Jay Powell basically signaled, okay, well, that's it for now, folks. Um, 
until the meeting after the election. We won't do anything, and the market didn't didn't like it too much. So so I think you know we're we're so heavily addicted to to even more and more. Uh, it is it is frightening, and 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 I think um, um, this year has been um, for 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 every one of us. I think as a as a citizen, as as businessmen, and also as investors and researchers, it, it has been extremely fascinating. I I I I I I completely I, I learned agree. a lot and yeah. and 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 I think you know when it comes to inflation expectations so um I think that's that's the major difference between 2008 and 2009 to to spring of this year if you have a, if you compare inflation expectations um they recovered much much more quickly this time than in 2008, 2009. And, and, and this suggests that uh, now it is not only um, monetary policy, but also fiscal policy. But this time around, I think um, um, central bankers acted much more quickly and much more aggressive. And on top of that, we have seen this enormous amount of fiscal policy uh, stimulus. And and this basically led to this to this great recovery in in inflation assets. I mean, uh, of course, in in gold and silver in the mining space, but also in in inflation expectations. They they rebounded extremely quickly, and and this just tells me that you know in this in this system that is so so much over levered, where basically this over indebtedness is is seen. Um, in every level, you know, for for corporations, for sovereigns, for for private individuals, we just cannot um, afford any deflation, and 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 this was very telling from my point of view, and and I think we we will also talk about. Um, this paradigm shift that might happen from from disinflation to inflation, and I think you know when it comes to basically this fork in the road, I think we have seen that in in spring of this year. So 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 we're heavily um, geared to to a more inflationary future. So let's talk about that fork in the road because I I happen to agree with you, but I'd love to hear why you think we've hit the fork in the road. Like, why is this time different than 2008, which also had lots of quantitative easing, lots of worries about inflation, yet it didn't materialize? Why is 2020 different? Well, I think, first of all, um, uh, when it comes to the definition of inflation, um, Austrians, and, and, and by that I don't mean Austrian citizens, but followers of the Austrian School of Economics, which is, by the way, not not really taught over here. I think we're <laughs> extremely Keynesian over here, uh, and it's fascinating that in countries, in former socialist countries, uh, for example, in Eastern Europe, they they really know their their Hayek and their Mises because they they just know how socialism feels and they don't want to have it again. Um, but but I think you know if 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 you come up with the Austrian definition, you would say, okay, there has already been an enormous amount of uh, of inflation, uh, meaning meaning monetary inflation. But we have also seen the second stage, which which is asset price inflation. So, you know, just have a look at real estate markets all over the globe. Have a look at um, equity markets, of course, uh, the art market. Um, you know, collectibles uh, uh, going crazy. I, I just somebody said that that the cardigan that that Kurt Cobain wore at the MTV Unplugged was sold for for a ridiculous amount. I think six hundred thousand or something like that. So, so you're seeing this asset and in price inflation in, in 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 all sorts of of areas, and and most importantly, of course, in the bond market. Um, but so far, we haven't seen any price inflation, and and this is exactly what what central bankers want to achieve, and and I think few believed that the Fed could tame inflation in 1979, and few believed that the Fed or central banks in general can spur inflation in 2020. Um, that's that's what our mutual friend Luke Roman said, and I and I totally agree. Um, Paul Foucault's job was to kill inflation. Now, central bankers all over the globe want more and more inflation. They're very vocal about it. And 
And this is something that, that the gold community doesn't really like when I tell them, basically, you're sitting in the same boat like, like central bankers. <laughs> it makes <laughs> them feel a bit uneasy. But, you know, when it, when it comes to this, um, to this change that we're seeing, first of all, I think it is the, the combination of very, very aggressive uh, central bank policy and fiscal policy. That's, that's right. one thing. The second thing is, I think this this grant this trend to you know deglobalization is is definitely um, uh, an inflationary driver. I, I think that in general uh, uh, this this kind of Cold War um, period that we, we we seem to be entering um, might also be 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 inflationary going forward. Um, and I think that you know. The, the, the irony that we're seeing at the moment is that the greater the deflationary concerns that that policymakers must fight today, the greater the debt buildup and the higher the inflationary risks are in the future. So, so I think you know if if central bankers would do nothing, of course the laissez-faire approach would be highly deflationary. Um, our monetary system wants to deflate, but um, in our monetary system, we just cannot afford any deflation. So we have to counteract with inflationary policies. So we described that with uh, tectonic plates pushing against each other. And I think at the end, uh, inflation will will kind of win. Um, and probably the most important driver is, is, is really the fact that at the moment... Um, it seems, and 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 I owe uh, quite a lot of um, um, uh, respect to to Russell Napier, who did a tremendous job in in pointing um, the world uh, to that fact. I think that governments really want to take over um, 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 credit creation. We, we've seen that with all those state guarantees, and and politicians seem to think, okay, that that works pretty well. So let's let's guarantee um, an infrastructure deal, a new green deal, um, education, whatever. And and this, it also ties or or goes in the into the direction um, of the MMT camp. And Kevin, you've been writing about MMT um, uh, quite extensively, and and I totally agree. I think it's um, from a philosophical point of view, uh, perhaps we 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 don't like the ideas of MMT, but I think nobody really cares about our opinions because this is the re- the, the 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 direction where the world is heading to. MMT-like policies, uh, I think, especially if Joe Biden wins, but we're seeing also um, moves into that direction uh, in the Eurozone. I think this is really what's what's going to happen. And th- therefore, I think, you know, it, it means, of course, less, less free markets, less capitalism, more interventionism, more inflation. Um, that's 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 the path that we have taken, and, and I think that when it comes to 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 political um, science, but but especially when it comes to central bank policy, path dependency is is something crucial that um, uh, one has to understand. When an institution sticks to a path for so long, it finds its options very limited to detour. And to exit this path, and they will go on this path. So I think, you know, going forward, I think 2020 might really be the year when we switch from a highly disinflationary or deflationary environment to an inflationary one. And just have a look at the price of gold, have a look at commodity prices, have a look at commodity currencies. They're already showing us that inflation is being discounted. Ronnie, that's great stuff. And one of the things that I, I, I liked best about your analysis was the comparison of 1979 being the end of inflation and the kind of the era of disinflation. And if we go back to that period, that was a time, a great time to buy bonds. Real yields were very high. And over the next kind of 40 years, you rode that bond bull market. Yet now we're sitting in a situation where bond yields are minuscule and inflation looks like it's picking up. Do you foresee a disaster in the bond market going forward? 
Well, a disaster. Uh, I mean, uh, I would say, you know, in, during the 1970s, precious metals bull market, 10-year real yields uh, got as low as um, minus 4.9%. And, and now, basically, the Federal Reserve said, okay, we'll have uh, uh, zero, um, zero nominal rates until, what was it? 2023 something like right. that uh, and prob probably longer yeah. um, and I think it's, it's it has also been really really crucial and and many of my colleagues didn't really really get that I think the average inflation targeting is really um, a, a big shift when it comes to Fed policy so so basically they are telling you okay nominal rates will stay at zero I don't think they will that the Federal Reserve will go negative because it just doesn't work over here in Europe for example Um but then they tell you, okay, inflation was undershooting over the last couple of years, and two percent is is not the ceiling. We want to see two percent on average. So for the next couple of years, inflation has to overshoot. So so this is basically the recipe for negative real yields for the next years to come. And you know, we we wrote three thousand pages of research about gold, and and I think really one of the most important drivers, if not the most important driver for gold is, first of all, the absolute level of, of real yields, but more importantly, the direction of yield, real yields. So ah. we see falling real yields or rising real yields. And I think, you know, and that, that makes me really relaxed when it comes to gold, because let's face it, we, we just cannot afford real yields at plus four or five percent it's just it's would be game over so therefore i think the the foundation of this bull market in gold is very very solid and we, we've got one important chart in our in our chart book it's it's on page 49 and it shows you the really long-term gold price uh, as well as uh, the real fed funds rate and you can see the 1970s you had primarily negative real rates which was a positive uh, environment for gold then in the 1980s and 1990s you had primarily positive real rates so, which was a big opportunity cost for, for gold owners, of course. And since the year 2002, 2003, we have got mostly negative real yields again. And I think really, if you, if you boil it down to, to a few factors, I think real yields are probably the most important driver for the price of gold. And you can see it also on page 50, this extremely tight correlation between gold and, and five-year tips um, since 2012. And I think this is going to continue. So, so from a fundamental point of view, um, I expect uh, a pretty good environment going forward for the price of gold. When it comes to bonds, um, you know, we've got like 13 trillion uh, US dollars um, in negative yielding bonds. I think if inflation should become a concern, and, and that's kind of my... Uh, my base case, then I think, you know, you don't want to be in negative yielding bonds. So so I think if there is an exodus happening, where will this money flow to? And I think 13 trillion is, 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 is quite a lot of money. Um, will it go into the, into the stock market? Yeah, why not? Although we crunch the numbers and, and per definition, equities aren't the best inflation hedge. It, it really depends on, on the sector that you're in. Um, so from, from 1966 until 82, um, you know, on a real basis, stocks were a horrible uh, investment. And, and I can recommend the, um, um, uh, uh, basically a, a paper by Warren Buffett, how inflation swindles the equity investor. It's it's really really a great piece. Um, what, what's it? What's the title? I'm sorry to interrupt. I I never knew that he had written this paper. Do you know the title of it? Is it called how how, how inflation, inflation swindles the equity investor? I think. Oh, terrific. Well, we'll so I'm going to go make sure. I I don't know that one, so I'm going to make sure I read it. Yeah, it's 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 great. And and by the way, I think you know talking talking Warren Buffett, he um, he I wouldn't call him a gold bug. And 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 now of course he started buying uh, a barrick gold. And and I think right. you know people mix it up because he wasn't buying gold; he was buying a a mining stock. And 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 he saw a tremendous amount of of value on the balance sheet of barrick. I think there there are better mining stocks, but anyway. 
But it is not only the fact that 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 Berkshire is buying a mining stock now. He was also selling um, um, lots of financial um, um, holdings. I think the whole position in JP Morgan, uh, Goldman, and also Wells Fargo. So perhaps he's also making the inflation trade now. And I think we, what's even more important uh, was the news that um, uh, Ohio Pension Fund um, said they, they will allocate 5% of their holdings in gold. And I I really see this as the big trend from, from what we're seeing, talking to, to clients or potential clients. It seems that there is a completely new set of investors coming into the gold market. Um, those are really institutional players with deep pockets uh, that haven't had any allocation in the, in, the, in the gold or in the mining space. And now they are really entering the market. And, and, and I think that really this has to probably to do with, uh, with the inflation outlook. Right. So, Ronnie, a, a few things. Uh, let's start with just for those who don't know what real rates are. Could you just uh, briefly explain real rates to people? Because I know that someone listening might say, but rates were really high in the 70s. How were real na- rates negative? Why don't you explain wh- how that could be? Well, it's basically um, the, the, the nominal interest rates, or of course, you can also uh, take uh, five-year bonds or, or 10-year treasuries minus the inflation rate. Right. So. Um, that that gives you real rates, right? So for those who are wondering how in the seventies rates were negative, is because inflation was running higher yes. than inflation. But sorry, interest rates were below the rate of inflation, so therefore, in real terms, you were losing. Yeah. And now it's this, we can use tips yields as well in 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 the current environment because there's an actual product to use to to determine the real rate. The second thing I wanted to chat about was you mentioned this briefly: the average inflation targeting. Uh, the change that Powell did. And I have a real smart uh, subscriber to my letter that said to me, you know, we're going to look back at this period and the realize that this was a huge monumental shift in the way that the Fed uh, behaved and the market is not appreciating it enough. What would be your comments to him? Would you agree with that analysis that the market isn't appreciating how important that shift is? It is. It is. Um, 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 I, I think that, you know, nowadays, I mean, um, I read somewhere that that the average uh, investment advisor is is 54 years old. So right. in his professional career, he, he never really experienced any any inflationary or even stagflationary market environment. So so I think also that, that the fact that uh, basically, over the last couple of years, it was like the how do you say that the the boy who cried wolf. Um, many 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 people, especially also in the Austrian camp, they 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 said, okay, in two thousand eight, central bank balance sheets they are going bananas. It's uh, you know hyperinflation is around the corner. But of course, I mean, um, people tend to forget that that most of the money is not created via the central banks, but in the in the uh, uh, via commercial credit. So, so, so I think that 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 many people are just getting bored of this, you know, inflation is around the corner argument. But I think this time around, it it, it might really happen, and and I think that nobody is really positioned for inflation. Huh? I mean, that's uh, it, it is. Very much of a of a contrarian uh, 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 um, position that 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 you can have, and 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 I think you know we, we are managing a fund that is in investing in inflation sensitive assets. So so our investment universe is basically mining stocks, um, gold and silver especially, but also commodity stocks. Uh, it is commodities in general, but also commodity currencies like the Russian ruble, like the Canadian dollar, like the Australian dollar. And we manage our fund based on our uh, incrementum inflation signal, which basically tells us, you know, Government statistics like CPI and PCE, they basically tell you what inflation was a couple of months ago. So it, it looks uh, into the, how do you say? Um, the past. Into the past, yeah. Right. But we want to see what, what the market is discounting. So so we only use market-based factors. And our inflation signal is is, is, is the strongest since since we basically calculate it. And, and, and therefore, we're having the, um, the highest position in inflation-sensitive assets at the moment. So, so I 
I agree to 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 your reader. I think this this shift in Fed policy um, in summer was definitely underreported. Everybody was probably lying on the beach and having a good time trying to forget mm -hmm. about uh, a corona. But this is a big shift, and 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 uh, um, I, I always quote. I think you know I'm 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 really reading lots of stuff and that's that's what i truly enjoy about my job uh and and i think lots of finance was a was a terrific book that i have reread several times uh, and he says monetary policy does not work like a scalpel but more like a sledgehammer <laughs> and <laughs> and i think it's it's always really i mean that's that's going more into a kind of philosophical or political discussion but i think it's it's really important to to tell people that the monetary policy that we're having uh, and that we had over the last couple of years um created a huge distribution and 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 created is 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 uh, to a large degree um, responsible for for all the inequalities that we're having. I mean, I have uh, talked about asset price inflation, and 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 basically, I think it's 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 really important, and this is also why we try to inform or kind of educate our readers uh, about our monetary system because uh, it is something that is not taught at all, and 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 I think we. We should not forget that that this is really a, a systemic crisis that we are in, and I think that with uh, normal central bank policy and 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 uh, the the measures that were used uh, back in the days, um, we are seeing decline in a declining marginal utility. Uh, so we need more and more and even more aggressive measures to to see even. Uh, a smart impact on 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 markets. So, so I think this is, this is really important. And now I think um, uh, coming back to the inflation topic, I, I'm really pretty sure that that. This is it. Uh, I think this this is the year when when finally inflation is becoming a, a real topic again. Nobody is positioned for it, and as I've said, markets are telling us uh, inflation is uh, is being discounted. Right. So, Ron, one of the things that you mentioned is the fact that in 1966 to 82, stocks in real terms did poorly, but you said that there were certain sectors that you could that would outperform and do well in this environment. Obviously, gold, gold stocks were, were some of them. But what were some of the other surprising ones that people might not be aware of that do better in an inflationary environment? Well, in general, it's, uh, it's, it's companies with pricing power. I, I think that's, that's really the most important thing um, that, that uh, you want to see in your portfolio. Then, of course, it, it also uh, is important what kind of debt structure and, 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 and how the companies are financed. And... In general, I think you know um, you should lean more to a kind of hard asset uh, allocation. Of course, um, mining stocks did uh, tremendously well uh, in this stagflationary period, but also commodities in general, uh, the energy energy space, obviously, and and companies. I would say high quality companies that that had superior um, products where they could charge, um, where they basically could. Um, hand on the, the price increases that they saw to their clients. That's that's really that's really it. So so I think if inflation becomes a concern, you have to become much more selective in your in your sector rotation. Right now, the other thing that we talked that you talked about and mentioned was the fact that we are getting uh, an expansion of the investor base, meaning that there's more. Uh, pension funds and what I call long-term serious money looking at gold as an investment. I was wondering, have you actually experienced this with more people reaching out to you? Whereas, you know, in the, when you were writing your book a few years ago, you were sitting there in, in uh, Liechtenstein and, and a little bit lonely. And now all of a sudden you're the celebrity and getting calls from all sorts of pension plans and uh, you're becoming a little bit uh, kind of famous. Have you experienced that? <laughs> well, well, uh, you know, when, when I started writing about gold in 2007, um, I think interest rates were at 5% in the US. Um, mm -hmm. Fed balance sheet was like, I think, 700 billion. 
um it was <laughs> it was really a different time and and over the years of course um then it's uh, at some point uh when 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 gold is rising uh, the media um uh calls you and you do some interviews and stuff but also in in 2013 i was walking in the st on the streets and and there were some guys passing by and i said isn't that that gold guy from from incrementum um well, he doesn't look good. Probably correlates <laughs> with the price of gold. <laughs> and, and now, just just recently, you know, um, uh, gold bull market being back, and and I think in in spring when 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 gold was really really hot, my my ex girlfriend she called me, and I haven't heard from her in in, in I think thirteen years, and <laughs> she called me. Hi, uh, so how are you? I said, Yeah, I'm, I'm well. I'm married. I've got three kids now. Um, okay. Um, well, I want to buy some gold, and I said. Uh, <laughs> Okay, thanks for calling. <laughs> Read my gold we trust. So, so, so this is you know sentiment wise, it is definitely. I think we saw over the last couple of months um, that that sentiment really got extremely positive, and and I follow you know commitment of traders report and and sentiment trader and so on, but 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 from 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 a from a you know top down. Uh, technical view and and I did the CMT program and the CFTE and and I think it's you know technical analysis analysis really it adds lots of valuable tools to your to your toolbox and 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 to your approach and and for me the Dow theory and especially these those three phases of a trend were extremely valuable and 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 Charles Dow said First, there's the accumulation phase where only, you know, diehard contrarians buy into something against the media, against public opinion. That's, you know, when, 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 when you mention at a cocktail party that you're buying into this, um, this investment, everybody's going to ridicule you. Um, then the second stage um, is the public participation phase which is the longest phase. And I think we're in the middle of this public participation phase. I, this is the moment when, you know, the media picks up on the topic again, when everybody is getting a bit more positive, when at the, at the cocktail party you say, yeah, well, I like gold. Some people will say, yeah, gold is, is, is a good idea. Perhaps I should have a closer look. Um, perhaps, you know, do you have some, some mining stocks that you like? So, so I think we're like kind of the, in the middle of this uh, public participation phase. And of course, the third stage is the distribution phase where, um, you know, everybody's going crazy where JP Morgan comes out with a price target of 5,000, where everybody is buying junior mining stocks and where if you go to the cocktail party, um, everybody is going to tell you some, some financings in junior mining stocks in Burkina Faso or, 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 or in Mali. Um, so, so, so I think we are still far away from that. But, but I can tell you that uh, interest is definitely picking up. It is a new set of investors that is coming in. Um, I just um, attended the virtual um, Beaver Creek conference and then the, um, um, the Denver Gold Show. I had like 70 meetings with uh, with mining companies, and at some point I felt, okay, am I at a value conference now? Because those mining executives, they were really, you know, they were talking about their balance sheets. They were talking how to increase shareholder value, raising dividends. They were talking about record-free cash flow. Uh, really, really good stuff that that I haven't heard in the last bull market. Now. Yeah probably they they will screw it up in this bull market again at some point um but it is my job to basically make the good uh, a good selection and and pick the ones that uh tremendous uh, uh deliver shareholder value but it is really i think within the mining sector i think we're seeing the highest leverage on rising gold prices ever and and therefore i think that the mining space still is 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 pretty attractive also here we saw some some financings over summer, some some kind of shady promoters coming out. You know they were in the in the I don't know cannabis space and they were in the blockchain space and now they're doing mining again. But um, in general, I think that the industry is is is, is quite healthy at the moment. So Ronnie, Good. it's uh, it's Patrick here, and I, I want to circle back with you a little bit onto this inflation thing because for for over two years, me and Kevin have been like 
uh, at each other over and over again. Uh, you know, Kevin always like inflation is coming, and and I was like, yeah, but it, you're way too early. And and I really, you know, you're here saying this is it. This inflation is coming, but I I want to kind of put some context into time frame because. At the same time, as um, like I look at one of the great um, input variables into inflation uh, as being energy prices and oil, mm -hmm. which continues to be pressing at very uh, low levels. And you look at uh, the demand numbers coming out uh, on oil, still very weak. This coronavirus um, and the economic havoc it's causing around the world continues to be a deflationary drag. Mm -hmm. And no matter how much money they're throwing at it right now, it's just um, keeping things in check from becoming a deflationary spiral. At some point, I completely agree with Kevin and mm -hmm. yourself that inflation will be the end result. I, I, be, I, I do agree with that in principle. But I continue to be more in that camp that it's still a little early. Like there, this thing could still drag six months, a year of, of just economic turmoil that still will prevent that, that uh, manifestation of that inflation and that it could be more of a 2000, late 2021-22 story before we really see those scary numbers versus now. What do you think of that opinion I'm just giving you? Like, where would you push back on me on that? Well, I think you know when it when it comes to 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 energy prices, of course they're 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 pretty pretty important for the whole equation. Uh, and now we're like in the in the biggest uh, economic crisis since uh, probably the Great Depression. Uh, and I would ask you, why is Brent uh, then trading at at forty bucks and and WTI at at thirty seven? Um, I would suppose it should be. Uh, much much lower, but but on the other hand, um, I think you know there there is an enormous amount of of deflationary factors at the moment. Definitely, you know you see it in in rents, you see it in in of course of the uh, in the in the labor market. So 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 I I totally agree. There's there's lots of deflationary factors, but I think at the moment it is we are kind of at a point in time when those inflationary factors there they're, they're Kind of getting more and more uh, stronger and stronger, and and as I've said again uh, before, the longer we have these uh, these deflationary pressures coming in, I think the more aggressive central bankers uh, will have to become, and and fiscal policy will become, uh, and you know, we completely lost any 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 sense for those numbers, um, you know. Deficit is gonna be three trillion, four trillion, whatever. I mean, um, who, who who really can um, follow those numbers? Um, 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 nobody has got any 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 clue um, uh, about the size of and, and and the enormous amounts of money that that are and and and, and will be created. But I think you know, uh, most people underestimate the time lag, and. And I once said, you know, that's that's the that's the tequila uh, theory of money that I once uh, uh, <laughs> established. I said, you know, it's it's I, I don't do tequila shots anymore. Um, <laughs> I, I used to do it when I was studying, but you know, the first one is ah, doesn't taste really good. But then two, three, four, well, um, doing well, um, and then you know, it's 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 party on, and 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 then. If, at some point, you wake up next day, uh, and and you know the sister of your best friend is lying next to you, and and I think you know the, this time effect or this time lag, when 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 the effect really kicks in, this is completely underestimated by central bankers and 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 politicians. So all the money that is created now and that will be created over the next couple of months. Um, I think, and 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 this is a theory that that I had, and 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 I don't know if uh, if if it's a bad theory or if it makes sense. But I think you know the 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 major problem that we're having now is this enormous amount of uncertainty. Nobody really knows 
when it's gonna get better and 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 you know you, yeah. you you've got uh the winter now uh coming up over here we it seems that there's uh we are at the beginning of the second wave of 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 the whole covid crisis um they are kind of considering a second lockdown i want to go to to a conference in munich next week and i just don't know if if i should do it or or if i'll be able or allowed to do it and and this whole uncertainty that uh is in the market and and that is affecting our behavior I think this this uh, might be resolved once uh, a vaccine or a really good treatment will be introduced. I think this will really be the point in time when, you know, confidence is coming back and people will see the light at the end of the tunnel and everything will get a bit more positive. People will start, you know, perhaps considering booking a vacation again or, or uh, going to a conference in a couple of months later. So I think this, this vaccine could really be important, uh, really, really, really start this paradigm shift. So basically, this should be the point when velocity or, or the Austrians would call it um, demand to hold to hold money would kind of reverse and this might also be the point in time when actually central bankers would have to become more hawkish and they would have to say okay perhaps we've done enough we'll have to reduce liquidity um, politicians would have to say okay let's let's uh, reduce our stimulus but I am absolutely certain that they won't do it um, because they underestimate this time lag. And and then I think this is basically the perfect recipe for, for inflation in 2021 or, or, or perhaps even later. Um, our mutual friend Dave Rosenberg, he said, you know, talking about inflation or stagflation now is like when you served only the appetizer and you're already thinking about the dessert. Um, but, but I think it's, it's, it's a good comparison. And I often think, you know, um, you know, sh what, what shall I choose? You know, uh, is, will there still be place for the mousse au chocolat or the tiramisu <laughs> if we have this appetizer and this main course? So, so I think, you know, it, it just makes sense, um, positioning yourself for inflation, especially as inflation assets are, are still pretty cheap. I mean, I don't know anybody, um, outside of my my uh, bubble um, that is really bullish commodities. Um, yeah, if you have right. a look at, at copper prices, if you have a look at agricultural commodities, I think it's th those are really nice charts. So 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 perhaps you know I'm 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 a bit too early, but but I think you know there's not too much uh, downside actually. So, Ronnie, I, uh, that's a great thing. And I just said, uh, like, mic drop and you should walk away from Patrick in, in terms of uh, <laughs> his, his deflationary, uh, the world. Because I've been wrong for two years, right? Yeah, well, the, well yeah, it just it. took a, a worldwide <laughs> pandemic for you to get right. But anyways, uh, one of the things you mentioned, Ronnie, is so you you're responsible for it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. it yeah. <laughs> So one of the things you mentioned was the fact that you said that the uh, Bitcoin and uh, cannabis promoters have now turned into mining promoters again. And I just wanted to let you know that as a Canadian, uh, that's all is well with the world again, because those guys were originally <laughs> mining uh, promoters. They moved to the cannabis, then they moved to the Bitcoin. And now they're back to the mining. But you mentioned that you were at the Denver Virtual Gold Show. Yeah. Do you have any names that you will be willing to share with us of companies that you like that interest you and you think might be something to keep on our radars? Well, well, actually, I'm I'm not hundred percent sure if if I'm allowed legally, but I don't think that the Liechtenstein Financial Market Authority is 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 listening to your fabulous <laughs> podcast. <laughs> Definitely not. <laughs> <laughs> No, I think, you know, in, in, in general, uh, as I've said, you know, um, ju just to give you um, uh, a few fundamentals. Um, first of all, the top 15 North American gold producers have a market cap so small that, that Apple at the moment is nine times larger and Facebook is almost four times larger. Um, we're seeing, you know, price to cash flow. Um, being at the lowest level in 30 years. We're seeing price EBITDA uh, at a very low valuation. Uh, we're seeing that that actually, you know, uh, 
weak local currencies versus the US dollar is, 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 is one of the factors that we saw over the last couple of quarters um, being, a, being a big drive. We're seeing energy costs, um, an important contributor, still being reasonably low. And 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 I think Wood McKenzie came out with a fantastic study and they said the gold industry must spend 37 billion over the next four years just to keep production flat. So the industry will need to commission 8 million ounces of projects by 2025 um, to avoid a perpetual decline in gold supply. Now, that doesn't mean that I'm in the peak gold camp, which is completely nonsense because those people don't understand the stock to flow ratio it doesn't make any difference if we produce 3300 tons or 3000 tons because the, the the actual stock of gold is so big and uh, we're not only trading with the gold that is newly produced so so i don't think it has it it, it has an impact on the price of gold but it has a, a dramatic consequence for the 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 M and A activity. So so I really like um, um, first of all I like the silver space a lot. Um, we did lots of research on the gold silver ratio and and if our assumption is right that we're in a gold bull market then silver should continue to outperform gold. So you know the silver mining space is 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 very very small. So when investment flows into into silver mining equities, it it it's it's like the Niagara Falls falls running through a garden hose. So 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 that will have an impact. Then I like you know in the in the large cap space, um, you know there really really good management out there for example uh with agnico gold i was uh, i'm always very much uh, Im- impressed i think that that um mark bristow is doing a, a good job at Barrick. i think in general uh for the large caps if you want to keep it kind of conservative there's good names out there um on the you know smaller side i like for example Great exploration um, companies like Amex. I like uh, on the de- development side. I like Mineral Alamos. Um, I like O3 Mining, which is a, a great company. I like Skina. Um, I think that Corvus is 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 a great takeover story. I think in the silver space, Alexco looks great. Um, for the larger caps, um, I forgot Kirkland Lake. Um, still lots of upside from my point of view. And yeah, so, so there, are, there are great names out there. Um, I think the sector is still heavily under-researched. Um, I think there's, and, and this is something that, that we really want to change. Um, because, you know, let, let, let's face it, everybody wants or, 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 or everybody has a, an opinion on gold. Yeah. Uh, I've never met any investor who doesn't have a, an opinion on gold. <laughs> if it's if it's built on a you know a solid thought process, that's a different story. But but I think that the problem that the gold industry has is that there's lots of rubbish research out there that is mostly you know gloom and doom. Everything will go to hell. We will yeah. see hyperinflation, currency reforms, and uh, 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 civil wars. You should buy gold. Um, right. And for me, I think, you know, gold is, um, it's just like a good defender in your portfolio. And, and I, you probably don't follow Austrian soccer, right? No, but actually no. it's on my list. I was just about to ask you about it. <laughs> because, uh, you know, we, no, honestly, we had passed some emails back and forth, things we might talk about. And you mentioned the Austrian soccer. And I thought, boy, everyone was sure biting at the bit to learn about Austrian soccer. Yeah, so tell us about it. <laughs> I, I I think your <laughs> your your viewership is going through the roof now. Um, <laughs> no, I I said you know I'm I'm a supporter of 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 Rapid Wien, um and and you know being being a, a football or a soccer supporter from Austria that's that's a bit masochistic, um, but <laughs> but there was this defender called Robert Petzl and and he also they also called him the 
the Rote Roberts or the, the Red Robert because you often got a, um, a red card uh, right. or, or Iron Leg. That was also his nickname um, because he was really, you, you know, he, he, his technical skills were, were not really, really great. But he was just a very, very solid and, 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 and hard defender. And I think that, that Gold did a tremendous job this year just balancing your portfolio. Um, I think it, it it really did its job, and 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 we wrote about gold and said, okay, if you want to hedge against a recession, gold is a good idea. If you want to hedge against rising inflation or falling real rates, gold is a good idea. And if you want to hedge against a weak dollar, gold also does its job pretty well. And and therefore, I think you know. Um, I don't like this comparison. Is gold better than than equities? I think it doesn't make any sense. It's like if you compare the Austrian soccer team to the Canadian hockey team, yeah, it's yeah. it's nonsense, yeah. <laughs> but I think you need a solid defender in in your portfolio. Um, we still know that 05 percent of all um, um, uh, investments at the moment are in gold and gold related equities. So basically, nobody is really invested. So I think you know. Um, that 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 gives that makes me pretty pretty uh, pretty optimistic going forward. And I sometimes I think you know perhaps it's a bit too easy. Um, and 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 I think you know where is where is the flaw in my in my thought process? But you know then I think you know just just have a look at the chart and it's just gold is rising in every currency. Mining stocks are outperforming gold. Um, silver is now outperforming gold. So it's really a stealth bull market. And, and, and therefore, I think, what, what should you do in a bull market? You should buy the dips. And, and this is what we're doing. Well, that's right. uh, some great advice. And uh, one of the things you mentioned is how it's a great defender. And it made me think back to the fact that you're from Liechtenstein. And are not, you're not from there. You're from Austria. But you work in Liechtenstein. And... Yeah. Uh, I've actually been there. It's, uh, I know it's a strange place to have visited, but my best friend actually worked for a big <laughs> company there. And one of the facts that I love best about, your, about that country is the fact that they actually had negative one fatalities during a war. Do you know this story? No. <laughs> oh. So in 1866, the Liechtenstein army had an army of uh, 80 men and fought in the Austro-Prussian How do I say yeah. that? Prussian? Prussian. War. Yeah. Okay, so they suffered no injuries or deaths. And then the good part about it was they were her- returned home with 81 people because they made a new Italian friend who decided <laughs> to, to join their army. <laughs> I didn't know that one. <laughs> yep, so the 80 men went to war, 81 came back. That's my kind of war. <laughs> now, you have to tell me a little bit about your country that you work in because uh, I, it's one of those kind of countries that... Uh, a lot of people are curious about because it's such a small little place. And what's it like? Well, it, it's. Uh, I, I always ask people who ask me about Liechtenstein. I ask them, "Have you ever been to Las Vegas?" I say, <laughs> "Yes." Okay, Liechtenstein is the complete opposite. Um, so it is. <laughs> it is a no fun. It is a. No, it is. It is a very conservative place, and it is. Uh, you know, I, I, I just, uh, I love the fact that that our company is there. It's, it's extremely solid. It is one of the few countries. I think there are five countries on Earth with without any government debt. So, so actually, they they are running a surplus every year. Um, the the Liechtenstein family, they 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 they're heavily influenced by the Austrian School of Economics, so they treat their their clients, as they say, um, really well, and and they want to deliver good services to them at, at reasonable prices. So there's a um, uh, a great book by by Hans Adam Lichtenstein. It's called uh, "Government in the um, uh, in the the Government of the Future." I don't I don't know the name of the English translation, but um, it, it is a, it is a fantastic book. And you know, it's it's fairly small, thirty five thousand people. Um, that's that's the whole country. It is uh, very flat hierarchies. Um, if you deal with government officials, it's it's very casual. Uh, they want to solve problems together with you. Um, the banking system is extremely solid. It is not in the European Union. Um, they have got the the Swiss franc, which is also 
probably one of the more solid current currencies over here. So I think it, it is a fantastic place um, to be located with the business, uh, especially when it comes to the financial services industry. They're very, very open to, to um, the whole blockchain technology, to cryptocurrencies. So there's quite a lot of uh, stuff going on. And, and I really uh, appreciate the fact that, that we're based there. So I, I, I'm reading that once a year, all the residents are invited to a party in the castle. Yes. Uh, so have beer. you gone? Is it, is it a good party? Is it... Uh, <laughs> like the punch bowl with tequila kind of party? <laughs> it's nope. a bit different, yeah. But but there's free beer. Uh, it's 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 good times, yeah. But it's it's um, I wouldn't um, compare it to I don't know spring break in in, in, <laughs> in Illinois. <laughs> <laughs> yep. No, we went to Panama City Beach. Um, yeah, oh, Florida. Okay. That was there, there special. You go. Well, yeah. I'll leave you with one last interesting fact about uh, Liechtenstein. They are the um, lo- world's largest leading manufacturer of false teeth. Yes. Yes. Oh, yeah. They they make twenty uh, percent of all teeth though false teeth. They make sixty million sets of teeth every year. That's crazy. That's, that's, yeah, that's probably a good good market to be in. <laughs> As people get older, you're absolutely yeah. correct. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's uh, it's it's a very very uh, innovative country. I think the the number of of uh, how do you say pay, patents um, per per capita um, is extremely high. So there's lots of uh, market leaders in in small niches like like Hilti, for example, which is a, a company that is successful all over the globe. Uh, and many people don't believe how many famous companies are coming out of this. Very, very small country. But it tells you a lot if, you know, um, if, if the government doesn't interfere and just lets it, it, it people and, and entrepreneurs work. Um, you know, there's uh, lots of creativity and uh, entrepreneurial um, spirit that, that can be used to, to, to be successful. There we go. I knew we'd get some Austrian economics from, my, from you. And there, there, <laughs> we'll leave it with that. So listen, Ronnie, it's been a pleasure having you on. I've enjoyed this tremendously. I look forward to uh, doing this again someday. In the meantime, why don't you tell people where they can find you, where they can see you on Twitter, and where they can find your terrific, I'm going to call it the Bible of the gold market. I don't mind. It's that good. <laughs> Thank you. Um, well, I'm 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 quite active on on Twitter. My handle is at Ron Stoeferle. Um, our webpage is incrementum.li, which stands for Liechtenstein. Um, so there you can find out more about our uh, investment services. We are running investment funds and and wealth management and special mandates, especially in the. Um, real asset space and, and, and commodities and precious metals. And then um, our webpage that is dedicated to our In Gold We Trust report, where you can find this year's In Gold We Trust report and, and the previous 13 editions, as well as the chart book, everything in German, English, and also in Mandarin. Um, the webpage is ingoldwetrust.report. Terrific. Well, thanks again, Ronnie. Thanks, thanks Ronnie. Thank you very much. It was great fun. Thank you, gentlemen. Okay, Patrick, it's time for Talking Charts. What do you got for us? Well, you know, we had a long show. We're just going to cover some of the key charts that we want uh, just to see what's going on. That S&P 500 has been bouncing since last week, but uh, so far, uh, not an impressive uh, run for the bulls. I mean, it's pretty much been one big up day, and then it's really been sideways price action since. Uh, it really does feel like it's toppy, even though – even. The news of, of uh, Trump getting the uh, the vid has uh, started some selling, but it never really followed through. What's your take on that? Well, I think that the fact that uh, Pelosi indicated that they were so close to doing a fiscal stimulus really put a bid to the market. But then, you know, at the end of the day, the tech stocks looked awfully weak. It's difficult. One of the things, Patrick, I was noticing is the fact that this morning going into the unemployment number, which is usually what we would be focusing on in this environment, it was a complete nothing burger. It almost felt like it was uh, Christmas, you know, the, the Christmas Eve and there was nobody at the turrets and there, there was nobody trading. And I'm a little worried about it. It's a little spooky. <laughs> it is. Well, when but, you, when, yeah. when I see things not moving and, and I don't really understand why. 
It's uh, it's interesting though because uh, even though, like you were saying, even though the uh, the S and P was down twenty points, Nasdaq was down three hundred and twenty points today with a pretty uh, distinct uh, bearish engulfing candle coming down on the downside and a lot of red on the fangs. I mean, Tesla was down 7%, but you had Apple down 3%, Facebook down 2.5%, Microsoft down 3%, Amazon down 3%. So while the S&P seemed to be just hovering, NASDAQ was eating it pretty hard, right? Yeah, it looks like, uh, which is also unusual because you think with the news that uh, the U.S. administration is coming down with the, with the Rona that, that you would see those kind of stay-at-home stocks get bid. And in fact, it was just the opposite. Yeah, it was. And so what I wanted to do is come back here and then let's let's talk some of these commodities because another 4% down day on crude. Oh, it's ugly. Crude is rude these days. Yeah. I mean, this this guy hit pretty hard. And what's interesting is that we're down to uh, that low from early September. Uh, and the big question is, is there another leg lower? Now, uh, I, the, the FIB zones that I've been watching are all the way down into the low 30s, which, uh, but I, I've still been in the conviction that this is a one big buy on dip. But, uh, I mean, could, we, could this whole uh, de- oil demand thing be dragged out and oil goes for a full double bottom retest? Like this is, by the way, the November contract. So, I mean, a, a retest of the, those April lows is not minus 40, but rather down into the mid 20s. But uh, but do you think that there's a chance that we go de- well, for there's always I'm not a chance. The, I'm not the dumb and dumber guy. There's always a chance. But uh, I do. I think that's likely. No, I don't think that's likely. Yeah. I, I look at it and uh, I think this has a lot to do with the fact that the Chinese were away on their golden holiday. It, and yeah. it started with, I don't know if you were going to talk about it, but the copper just was Yeah, well, look at the recovery today. Yeah, well, copper you were watching. Is, oh, I was watching because I'm long, <laughs> to, way too much copper. But uh, I was kind of joking and saying that copper is like that crazy girlfriend you lived with in university. <laughs> <laughs> like really, honestly, it's like you're not. Yeah, she's a lot of fun, but you're not sure you, you want to settle down because it's uh, it's it's a little yeah. bit all over the place. So, I, I'm I'm going to chalk it up just to the fact that the Chinese weren't there for for uh, the I, bids. And... I think that's that's a soft excuse, but it, we'll give it to you for now. I per, I personally think that it's all uh, the dollar is going to play such a big role, and the dollar hasn't shown its hand. So I think I still think there's more to, for this to play out. But I wanted to just get. Uh, I just have a quick chat about this um, yield curve, the fives thirties, because I know you've been toying around with it. Are you still long this? Yeah, I I, I try not to look at it. It's just a core <laughs> position. Honestly, you think I'm kidding? It's a core position. I don't look at it. I, I actually didn't well, even I know guess where you, it was you just week. you just don't have a big size of it, you, or do you have? Well, I have size? enough on that it doesn't matter. I kind of see it moving around, but I'm not watching every tick. No, because I I want to I want to wake up a year from now and just. Uh, be long this thing so i put it on in a size that it can i can live with the intraday swings and i don't worry about it i'm not going to trade it is basically why i why i don't look at it yeah no but generally uh this has been uh from a from a perspective technical perspective this it looks really good i mean obviously this is just really a a, a play on how bearish the 30-year yield gets right because you're, you're 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 in the bear steepener camp right yeah, well, it's tough for the five year to go like, uh, much to lower. Much better. Right? Yeah, what I mean it's about twenty eight basis points, right? Yeah, it's, you expecting it to go to zero or negative? I guess it I could mean, happen. It could, but that's not where the big contributor to this really. You're just t- looking for that big blowout. Uh, you know what? This this it's interesting. I would not be expecting this to be steepening at this stage, and so therefore the fact that it is, it's interesting to me, and that's why I wanted to bring it up in today's session. I'm kind of proud see. of you, Patrick. You're you're bringing up charts that don't agree with yourself with your thesis i like it well you have to stress test some of the ideas even though i'll be right in the end no just kidding (laughs) (laughs) anyway so listen let's leave it at that for the talking charts we'll do a longer session next week and let's uh let's move on okay folks it's time for that oh sorry i'll start again okay folks it's uh cuppy corner time it's a fan favorite he's back harris kupperman in the house how are things doing well how are you guys Good, Great. man. Good. Great. A uh, little bit of exciting day today. Yeah, it was super exciting. Uh, Trump's got COVID. <laughs> <laughs> 
Oh, don't sound like so excited. Uh, what uh, uh, I was actually thinking the other day that uh, we in Canada, we've had three uh, leaders with it. We had the leader of the opposition, our Tory, uh, you know, our conservative guy had it. Our Bloc Québécois had it. And then the prime minister's wife, wife had it. And I thought, you guys must just be better with your leaders at making sure they don't get it. And then uh, as soon as I thought that, the news hit. Yeah, I think Trump was saving it for later, you know, right, uh, right before the voting. I think it's the best thing that's ever happened to him. Why? Uh, yeah, indulge us. Why, Why is this? Guys, you can't be uh, an asshole to a president when he's recovering from COVID. I mean, look at the New York Times. They even toned it down. They're like level four angst instead of eight. Um, no, seriously, even Nancy Pelosi wished him well. Come on. He's playing checker. I mean, he's playing chess while we're all playing checkers. As a good friend of mine, I, I was thinking he's playing like, you know, third level, you know, uh, thought process here. And he gave himself COVID this week because, you, you know, you know how it is. They're going to have an update every 15 minutes. You know, Trump's feeling a little better. We're hoping we're, for Trump. We're praying for Trump. Trump had some chicken soup today. You know, it's, it's, he, it, it makes him human again. Ah, um, there we go. It's all part no, it of really the master does. plan. It's okay, brilliant. Be- I reached out to a good friend of mine, and I'm saying, you know, this must have all been premeditated. I don't even know if he has it. And my friend said, no, Trump just kind of like falls forward successfully. Every time he <laughs> screws up and trips on something, he falls forward and wins. And uh, he they, just did it again. Well, there you go. Before we get to piss off all of our listeners somehow by saying something offensive politically, <laughs> let's just move on. So you had a great day today, Kapi. Uh, um, you had the tortoise acquisition, the SHLL, which got a new symbol your arbitrage trade came in line, right? Yeah, the, you know, I put this thing on at uh, $14 credit, and I did it through some uh, short calls. So it was really 21 credit to me. And uh, as soon as they changed the ticker symbol, it came in. Now it's trading uh, nine wide, which, I mean, it's basically 50% of the spread came in in one day. And, you know, it's, it's looking good. <laughs> That's right. You, you make it sound like it's a change in the ticker symbol that did it. <laughs> Well, I think people realize that Hylion, Hy- Hy- I don't even know how to pronounce this thing. I mean, it just sounds like a fraud. Uh, <laughs> well, I actually think it's because the, the warrants became registered and they became abil- you know, the ability to uh, exercise them, right? Did they register them? Well, I think so. Or that's, I think that's what's happened. I think it has to do with the registration of the warrants. And that's why the spreads come reg- in. I don't see any registration statement yet. It hasn't, hasn't hit the tape. No, I... I I think it's just a function of uh, the Robin Hooders kind of giving up on this thing. I mean, in the end, this is the second one of these we played. Uh, Kevin and I played uh, Nicola. And, you know, the Robin Hooders can buy the, the SPAC, but they can't buy the warrant, so the spread blows out. And, I mean, this is about as riskless as you can get in finance to put something on and just sit there and wait for it to compress. And, you know, it compresses on the registration, which is about 30 days from today. Um, I'm happy it's compressing sooner, you know, gun to my head. I want nothing in terms of exposure going into this election. And and I'd love to take it off when the spread, you know, collapses to only a few dollars wide. So I'm I'm happy it's making tracks. For those who don't know, um, I was so proud of Cuppy when he started to understand and explain the fact that the borrow rate affects the forward on the option pricing. I thought, God, this guy's turning into a real option trader. I learned from a master. <laughs> <laughs> You're going to be up there giving us lectures about gamma and theta and vega risk before you. Oh know no, it. no 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 no. <laughs> <laughs> but but it was listen. It was a great trade. It was it was something that everyone should look at and make sure you go and follow Cuppy's blog because you chronicled the whole thing. Um, and it's one of these arbitrages that yes, it, it's independent of the rest of the market. So when while we're all looking for such you know kind of uncorrelated assets these sorts of trades are terrific and they just keep popping up i mean i don't know why but ever since the world ended in march these sort of event driven trades have just been more lucrative than anything else i really do think that there were some big event driven funds that blew their brains out and there's just not a lot of capital right now searching for these sort of things and the spreads are wider than they used to be and the opportunity is better than it's ever been. I mean, of course, you know, this will eventually converge and there'll be a bunch of people looking at event driven. But right now I just keep spending more and more of my time on event driven. You know, I wrote about another one of these, which is the the Dillard's short squeeze. Uh, You know, it's it's, it's the great uh, Dillard's uh, corner of, you know, 2020 or whatever. It's like the, the, what's it, the Northern Pacific or whatever. Like, 
<laughs> that was like the last great corner. It, it, it's the same sort of situation though. You have a company like, I don't think I actually want to own this thing long term, but there's 6 million shares short and there's like 5.5 million shares in the float. And if you take out the ETFs, there's like 4 million shares in the float. It, it, and Dillard's just keeps going in there and chomping Is away. That, that's the symbol DDS, still. right? That's correct, the DDS. Correct. So it's this. Okay. All right. So it'll be it, the, the Dillard's, the company, you know, they're just using the revolver and they're buying back shares. I mean, they bought back 260,000 in August. I assume they kept chomping away at it in September because starting a few days ago, the borrow rate went from like 15, 20% and it spiked all the way up to 130%. So wow. clearly someone's scrambling around there. And then it stayed there at about 130 for about two, three days. And the stock started to boogie too. And um, I, I don't know where this is going to end. Uh, I, I just think it's going to end higher. Uh, for those playing along at home, just remember, uh, short squeezes end and then they collapse. So make sure you sell a little on the way up. Right. <laughs> I, I was telling you that it trades a little like a rat on acid. It's, it's, <laughs> all, it's all over the map. It's a, it's a tough one to trade and it, and it goes in these violent waves. And this is what happens when you get people getting bought in, right? It doesn't right, trade right. normal. I mean, if you look on the screen, you'll see it'll just sit there and be trading very little volume. Then it'll have a $2 bar on like 50 or 100,000 shares. And, you know, mind you, this is the sort of company that only traded like 200,000 shares a day. But there'll be a 50, 100,000 share just market order as someone who hasn't had borrowed just goes lifts it. But then, you know, whoever's selling it to them, it just screws up someone else's borrow and this thing kind of cascades through. In, in the end, it's musical chairs and... Like I said, there's about uh, four million, uh, you know, total shares in the float, and there's six million short, and the company keeps buying it in. I don't know how this thing ends, but because I don't think it's a precedent for this outside of that that northern corner, where I mean, for students of history, uh, uh, two robber barons wanted to control this railroad, and they fought each other because they each had forty nine percent of the shares, and they were literally willing to pay any price for that last share. And some guys got short and they couldn't buy it in. They couldn't cover and the stock basically went to infinity. And these robber <laughs> barons were, well, I mean, if you just need one more share to get uh, your proxy, like you can pay infinity for that last one share. I mean, if you don't, especially back then, the other guy was going to loot your railroad and you have nothing. So <laughs> it, it was just this crazy thing. And I, right. I don't know if this could be as crazy, but it might. <laughs> <laughs> so. So, Kapi, I have a problem when you send me this stuff and you start talking about this event-driven trade, but you always talk about it and you give me the initials. And you talk about ED, and I keep thinking, I, like, I, I, you know, <laughs> my own personal problems is this is my own personal problems. Why do you keep talking about ED with me? <laughs> I don't know what else to call it. <laughs> you got to come up with a new name. ED just is a terrible name. It, it just it is you got to come up we got to come up with something else or at the very least stop calling it ed because it just <laughs> it conjures up the worst i the worst connotations so listen who do you oh, look think at the dillard's up? chart look at the dillard's chart it looks like it just popped three viagra <laughs> <laughs> so uh what who do you think blew up like talk to me about like speculate like what do you think happened do you you mentioned i have no idea i just you really that. think that there's less there's less uh competition in this square oh absolutely because i mean if you looked a year ago this stuff would all be so arbed out like highly on there's not even a borrow cost it's like 22 percent right now like there's no way that this thing would exist given how liquid it is it traded seven million shares today um, you know, this thing would be like $2 off intrinsic. It wouldn't have ever blown out to 14 and it wouldn't still be sitting there nine to intrinsic. It, this, right. Whoever, I mean, all, whoever was doing this in the past and arbing these sort of things out, they're, they're out of the game. Right. That's interesting. That's great. Well, that's, listen, I, really people should have a look at this because these are some great ideas that you've been talking about. And I guess they're a little bit of complicated and you have to short some stuff, but a lot of times it's truly an arbitrage and it's a great offering some great returns. Now let's get on to what we really want to talk about. You've mentioned it before on this show, but uh, we're getting a little sneak peek on your new position that you've been uh, very enamored with. Why don't you tell us what it is and uh, what's, why you think it's headed a lot higher? Yeah, well, I've had that crush on this one stock for a while and, you know, I, I kind of watched it for a year and th th this this summer I finally said it's, it's time and, you know, I guess it's, it's, it's Joe time, you know, uh, <laughs> the stock is, it, it's Joe time. Um, no, the stock is uh, St. Joe, the ticker is J-O-E, uh, it's my largest position by far, um, you know, I, 
I think there's a lot of ways to think about this uh, company, but uh, it hits pretty much every macro trend I'm, I'm uh, fixated on right now. You know, everything from the people moving from uh, you know, cities to suburbs, people moving to the state of Florida for tax purposes, uh, land is a hard asset against inflation. Um, you know, just all the different trends, that they, they all converge with uh, St. Joe. And, you know, when I think of it, I think of this as kind of my gold proxy in, in many ways. And it's actually better than gold because while you have land which should you know, track inflation, I'm coming into this thing about 20 cents of the dollar. You know, it's, it, it closed today about 21 bucks. And, you know, I think the NAV is north of 100. And, you know, you can make the case that it's, uh, you know, a good chunk north of 100, depending where you, you know, peg the assets. Uh, so you're coming into gold at, you know, a big discount to the fair value of gold. And, um, you know, gold just kind of sits there in your sock drawer and doesn't do much of anything. And this thing's actually earning some money. Uh, I, I think they'll earn about uh, buck fifty next year. Uh, you know, I think in twenty twenty three they'll be you know kissing up on two bucks, maybe even a little over two bucks, depending on how it's going. But you're basically buying into a company that's growing you know thirty to fifty percent a year every year, probably for the next uh, you know multiple years, probably five ten years into the future, just as people migrate to uh, the Florida Panhandle where they have their one hundred and seventy five thousand acres. Um, so you're going to get 30 to 50 percent growth. You're coming in at 10 times earnings, and they're giving you a hundred and change per share of land for free. And you know, it, I, I, I've now made two trips to the Panhandle this summer. One, I just love it up there, and it's I think it's the prettiest part of Florida. It's the best beach in the United States. Uh, it's just a it's kind of like the Hamptons of uh, the South, you know. Uh, I remember being a kid, we'd go out to the Hamptons in Long Island, and back then it was mostly just potato farms. And, you know, if you could have bought the, ha the Hamptons knowing what it would become, you'd have made a fortune. And I think this is the same thing. This is the Hamptons for Houston and New Orleans and, you know, Mobile and, uh, you know, Atlanta and all the other cities around there. And when you drive around there, you meet, it's, it's the one percenters from all those places. And, you know, if you're going to have a global equity asset bubble, the one percenters are going to do very well. And they're definitely going to want to go to their Hamptons. So in, in any case, um, I've been following this for a long time, but never really got like the traction needed. But it's, it's hit critical mass now. Uh, this year was the, the busiest that they've had. Uh, you know, you speak with all the locals. They've just been overwhelmed. There's like three, four hour waits at restaurants. And, you know, just getting an Airbnb for the week is painful just because so many people want to move there. is not enough inventory. And, you know, in the end, it's not enough inventory because the two main counties, Bay and Walton County, uh, St. Joe owns all the land. And they get to choose, you know, how it gets developed, when it gets developed. Um, and, you know, they're going to develop it as fast as their capital lets them. But, you know, I, I, like I said, I, I don't think, you know, you have all these compounder bros chasing SaaS stocks that aren't really growing very fast. And, you know, they're paying 30 times sales or something. And here you can come into something that's growing faster than most of those SaaS stocks, 30 to 50 percent a year. And you get to come into it at like 10 times earnings. So anyway, that, that's, that's kind of my, my, my pitch to you. I guess the, the catalyst that I think unlocks this is that, you know, this 7 million shares of this thing short. I don't know what these people are smoking. Uh, but, but they've been short for a while. And I think it's just one of those lazy shorts where they put it on 10 years ago and they kind of forgot about it. And, the, you know, the, the short pitch has always been, oh, you know, they have some really good acres. No one disagrees with me. But most of their acres are crap. You know, they're, they're worth 1,000 or 2,000 an acre. And uh, anyway, Margaritaville, which is, you know, Jimmy Buffett thing, they're building a mixed-use community. Uh, I, don't, I don't really know why you'd want to live in a Margaritaville, but that's, that's, that's a different topic. But uh, they're going to start putting them for sale in Q1. I think they sell out. Uh, you know, all the inventory for Q, for 2021 gets sold almost immediately. Probably the first or second day, like it ha like happened in Daytona in Florida. And when that happens, all these acres that all the shorts thinks are worth, you know, 1,000 or 2,000 an acre turn out to be worth 100,000 an acre. And I think that changes all the math on this because they have 175,000 of these acres. And if the worst acres are worth 100 grand and the best ones are worth a few million, uh, it, it just changes the whole price deck. And suddenly the shorts start panicking because, you know, you, you really start capitalizing this land at north of 100 a share. So anyway, that's my pitch. That's, that's It's my largest position. I've been buying it every damn day. Uh, every down day I go in and just grab another five, 10,000 shares and it's gotten to the point where my wife said I can't buy anymore. <laughs> it's pretty much all I own. <laughs> now, I, I have so many questions, especially from that last comment. First of all, <laughs> who knew that there was Margaritaville? And I, I, I'm going to be on the other side of your trade. I think a Margaritaville sounds awesome. All righty. We already have a new customer. <laughs> <laughs> okay. In all seriousness... Why do you think Wall Street's missing it? 
So we, this is the typical uh, scenario in most of the stocks that I follow. There's no investor relations function at the company. Uh, if you want to learn about the company, it's amazingly difficult. They have a corporate presentation, but you know, it doesn't really tell you much. There's no map of what they own. You have to act, you have to beg management to get the map. I have the map. But most people in New York have never been to the Panhandle. They, they call it the Redneck Riviera, and they think it's full of trailer parks. And you know, I was just there for uh, two weeks, and I invited a bunch of my friends who had never been there, mostly Northerners. And they came out there, and they go, wow, this is amazing. And I'm like, well, I told you it was amazing. They're like, I didn't believe you. I thought it would just be trailer parks. And I go, <laughs> no, these are $10 million homes in this mile upon mile of them. And my friends are like, yeah, I get it now. And then, so you, you know, you're looking at it and you see these five and $10 million homes on one side of the street. And on the other side of the street, as far as the eye can see, is St. Joe land. And you realize that you could build more of those homes. And all my friends are just like, I got to buy more shares. Like, you're, you're right. Wow. wow. And so it's, so it's just a question of Wall Street not caring. There's no investment banking business to do. And it's just There's no it's, investment banking. You know, the, the company's been shrinking the float. They buy back about 2% of the company each year. So, yeah. you know, they're, they're not out there telling the story. They, they, they want to get more shares. Um, you know, it, it, it's kind of, it's this thing where, you know, a lot of people got burnt about 20 years ago during the last housing bubble because at the time they, you know, told you how great the land was and it was great. But it just wasn't ready yet. Uh, the right. panhandle wasn't growing. It's this chicken and egg funny thing. So if you have a bunch of land and you want to uh, develop it, well, until you have uh, people and residents, you can't build a grocery store or a Starbucks. And you, know, you can't sell uh, home sites if you don't have a Starbucks and a grocery store. So it just took a lot of time to hit the critical mass needed. And now they've hit the critical mass. It's just got escape velocity and it's going parabolic. But I, I think a lot of people have just been sleepy on the name and forgotten about it. Everyone just goes, oh, it's a land play. Those take forever to work. And it's like, right. yeah, it's, 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 been, it's been 100 years. It's taken forever. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So one of the things is Berkowitz has been – that was his big name, right? Because he went up against uh, Einhorn on this way back right. when, and he still owns it. He's chairman. He's the largest shareholder. Um, put it this way, okay? He had a very, very successful investment business. Uh, I mean, I, I admire the guy. He's you know, one of the greats in this industry. And he's pretty much made no money for the last decade. And that's because he just sat there with his Joe saying, I think it's worth 200 a share. And if you don't agree with me, redeem me. And as people <laughs> redeemed him, you know, he, he ran, what, billions and billions? And now he runs like his... PA and he calls it a mutual fund. <laughs> but as, as people redeemed him, he gave you know them back all the liquid stuff and he kept the Joe because that was the best. And you ended up with a mutual fund that really just owns Joe because he knows what it's worth. And I, I feel like um, he's going to be vindicated and you start looking at it and you look at it through the course of his career. He'll once again be one of the greats because I think Joe's a multi-bagger. You know, it, I think you have this sort of thing where let's say you know you peg uh, the, the land at 100 a share, just made up number. Okay, and let's say just through inflation and through population growth and everything else, the land appreciates 5% a year, another made-up number. Well, you might say, well, 5% a year, that's not that exciting in the equity world. Like, who's going to pay you 2 and 20 on that? But then you realize that 5 a year is on your uh, 21 purchase price, and you're starting to look at, uh, you know, 25% a year, add in the $2 of cash flow, now you're at 7 on 21, and you're making 30% a year. Like, that. that it starts getting pretty attractive in terms of just a compounder. You can buy it and forget it. And, you know, I think this one's going to be hard for people to analyze. I think a lot of people, uh, once you post this, uh, they're going to email me and be like, well, I built this spreadsheet and I'm plugging in this price per acre. I don't get to 100. And you just can't think of it that way. You can't take 175,000 acres multiplied by a per acre value. You really have to go there and understand it and see the assets and understand what's possible. And... I think people are going to have a hard time putting a concrete number around it, which is why it trades at such a large discount. It's just hard to analyze. Right. I get it. It's okay. So we got the St. Joe. What else is on your mind these days, Cuppy? Oh, the election. Um, I'm just degrossing, just degrossing. You know, <laughs> stuff comes across my plate and I'm just like, man, that's juicy. I want to take a swing at it. And then I'm just like, nope, election coming up, degross, degross, don't buy anything. And I'll buy a few shares and be like, oh, yeah, I'm supposed to be degrossing, degross, degross. I don't know what's going to happen election day. Uh, it looks like it's actually a lot closer of a election than you know, it was last time we talked about a month ago. Um, and I just don't know what's going to happen. And I think it could be terrifying. You know, on, on one hand, you know, Trump can win and then it's basically four more years of the same. 
in which case, you know, some, some stocks do well, some do poorly. And if the Democrats win, you know, it could be anarchy. I mean, if, if, if it seems obvious that the capital gains rate is going to increase in 2021, I would think that anyone who has gains is going to have to book them, you know, sometime in the six weeks after the election. Um, and you might see a lot of stocks, you know, collapse. And then, you know, the, the, the other scenario is that no one wins on day one and we fight it out in the courts for the next hundred years. And I definitely don't want equity exposure then. So right. I'm just degrossing mode. No one knows what's going to happen. I feel like you're not missing much on the upside and you can miss a lot on the downside and it can be kind of crazy. I mean, the stuff I'm, I'm, I'm carrying through into the election is like my Ruger puts. I, I, you know, I wrote a bunch of Ruger puts. I hope they assign me, you know, my Smith and Wesson puts. I got my Joe. I got my tankers. I got, uh, you know, some stuff like that, like my core book. But in the end, uh, I got a bunch of October paper that goes out worthless in uh, two weeks. And, you know, I'm, I'm just degrossing. Well, there you so, go. That's that's the mess. Oh, sorry, Patrick. Go ahead. Yeah, you know, I was just going to ask you. You're mentioning the tankers. I mean, they continue to just bleed. Do you think there's a <laughs> ca- is there a catalyst this year, or is this one of these things where you just got to wait it out like a St. Joe's? I mean, on the tankers, uh, I think the catalyst is when rates recover, and rates aren't going to recover until petroleum demand recovers. So you have these companies that retained huge amounts of capital, and they trade at one third, maybe at most half of net asset value. People look at the charts and they go, oh, you know, rates went up, rates went down, and they, they peg the stocks to where they were before rates went up, and they forget that they retained so much capital. Um, I don't know what unlocks that. It could be that, you know, QQQ, IWN, unwind, where these things just are caught up in the vortex of IWN, you know, catapulting, I, IWN being, a, you know, small cap value. Yeah. Or, or it could be rates recovering, or maybe tankers just suck. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's funny. Like my TK tankers, they locked in a third of their uh, vessels for the next year. So they're doing just fine. And they've been penalized all the same as the guys who are, you know, making no money right now. And then you have like my Dorian, which is, you know, the other tanker I'm long. And, uh, you know, uh, very large uh, gas carriers are actually earning record rates right now. Like people don't realize how much money they're making. And, you know, that one's hit just the same. I, I, I don't know, I guess it's... Well, every, everyone's degrossing, and then no one, no <laughs> one, no, no one wants, no one it's wants to let the, the money work. Yeah, like I've never day, used it before. Cu- it's, it's a cuppy it's word a, for it's me. It's a cuppy word. So you know, one last if thing. They're all be- degrossing. I mean, there's a lot of shorts they need to cover. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so true. the la- last thing we'll let you go after this, but I, I want to know what you think about Nat Gas, and I think it might be a sleeper hit, and if you still love the Sandridge. Yeah, I love Nat Gas. Um, I think it's going to work out just well. Um, you know, we're sitting here with oil at 37. Um, you know, no one's incentivized to drill, especially in, in the U.S. Uh, you know, production in the U.S. is going to trail off, which is great for my tankers. But if, if that production is trailing off, you know, the same happens when it, when it comes to uh, byproduct Nat Gas. And, you know, I don't know when Nat Gas is going to catch a bid, but it will. Um, and it's, it's going to be very good for the guys with a lot of gas exposure. You know, my biggest gas position is Sandridge. Um, they have effectively no debt. Uh, I think they'll earn somewhere between a buck and two bucks a share, uh, based on where you peg net gas next year. And it just seems silly that it trades at one times cash flow. And, you know, of course, you know, that if they're not drilling, it's in slow motion decline and it's probably going to decline in the twenties, but, you just build up a PDP deck of this thing and call Nat Gas three bucks, and I mean you have a double digit share price. And you know if, if oil recovers, you know you have a much better share price. And I don't know. I think this thing is a home run, but I mean I, I'm also like a terminal bag holder, so. <laughs> <laughs> there was something about the real estate was worth a buck a share or something anyways wasn't it yeah they sold they sold their headquarters they didn't get what i expected they sold their headquarters for 35 million i thought they'd get about 60 which is disappointed but they, they paid off all their debt um but yeah i mean when it comes to energy i seem to be an expert in how to lose money so maybe you should just do the opposite of me uh <laughs> well the reality is that everyone's gotten crushed right like how bad are the energy stocks they continue to trade like death and, and yeah, I guess, and it, it, like, it, it's crazy. Like some of these guys like Antero, they just rolled all their debt, okay? So the short thesis was they have a 2122 maturity wall and they'll never be able to refi it. Well, they just rolled all the debt forward and the stock's down anyway. Yeah. Nobody cares. Like the reality is that you're sitting there. How do you justify going and owning extra energy? Like, oh, you have to be sadistic to like stick that on your sheets and 
to get everyone mad at you and stuff. Like it's just it's just not worth it. It, it continues to have to trade to dumb levels for you know people that are just like this is a no brainer buy. That's when it's going to be time to buy it. Like, I think that happened two years ago. <laughs> well, I think though you're assuming that there's there's actual real bids out there. Like uh, I think it's going to be like the Philip Morris. Nobody wanted it on the sheet. Like it was only the people that were able to take the kind of uh, social pariah that was involved with owning the stock and sticking it on your sheets that that's the price it went to. They have become the, the cigarettes, the cancer stocks of our generation. Don't you think? Yeah, absolutely. But I mean, if you really want to go down that rabbit hole, why not just go in for thermal coal? I mean, why bother with that gas? That's clean. Just go straight for the thermal coal. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but but listen, that though has a good chance of a government legislating it out of existence, does it not? No, a quarter of the United States electricity comes from thermal coal. They legislated out of existence, and you and I are going to sit in the dark. I mean, you're not going to charge up your Tesla without a electricity it, it, it'll be a process and it'll be another 25 year process to you know in terms of running these electricity plants into the ground and replacing them and you know my, my, my thermal coal company should make a lot of money before now and then so what are some of your thermal coal companies for those that are willing oh, to God. take the political um, heat so I, I own some uh arlp uh, alliance resource um it, it's really cheap and the insiders own a lot of stock and you know, I used to pay a really fat dividend, but they canceled that to just delever a little. Um, but I mean, it's like two seventy five. It was like fifteen bucks two years ago. I mean, you split the difference, and it's a pretty good run. Uh, I, I own. I wrote some P, some Peabody puts uh, when when they didn't get their deal done with Arch, and I assume I'm going to get assigned on those. So I'm back in Peabody. Uh, what's the other one? HNRG. Uh, I don't know. I have a basket of these things. Uh, none of them's too big, with the exception of uh, Alliance. But, the charts um, just look like death. I was like, I was pulling up these charts as you were saying them. I was like, does Cuppy own anything that doesn't look like it's been cut in like by ninety percent? No, that's usually what I look like. But then, you know, <laughs> that's how it is. It's, it, but then you know, eventually they start looking like Dillard's, and you know, I start feeling smart. And yeah, that's, it's that's, just a process. <laughs> it's a process. <laughs> What I love best is when you have when we're chatting and some stock all of a sudden gets a huge bid and it doubles and you're like, oh, I own a ton of that. And I'm like, when do you own this from? Like, it, like I would love to see your inventory sheets because there must be so many just e-liquid, uh, crazy little value plays that nobody's ever heard of. <laughs> yeah, I got bad. I mean, I'm a core book, so I run a very concentrated fund. We're six to 12 positions. We tend to be like the top five names would be about 90%. And then I have my little, uh, you know, positions that is kind of like like little piker positions you know 50 bips 100 bips just to keep track of stuff and you know, i tend to pull a lot of alpha out of those little positions and you know it, the funny thing about small cap is that you got to buy it when it's hated and you got to sit there and inventory it like you said and three months later nine months later is that press release that unlocks it and it goes on a moonshot and you know you got that like 48 hour window to unwind it and then it just starts like going back into his death spiral <laughs> That's funny. That, that's funny. You know, in Canada, we have a lot of these deals with the unit deals where they give you half a warrant. And for a long oh, time yeah. in the in the two thousands, when the China situation was, you know, China was expanding and all these mining stocks were going crazy, all the hedge funds would buy these private placements, short the stock, and then be left with the warrant. And I remember one of my buddies went and worked for another hedge fund. He moved and he says. Kev, I got there and I couldn't believe how many lines of crappy words they had. He says it was literally like it was like each day it was, you know, half an inch thick of all these lines. It was madness. And that's kind of what I figure. Uh, that's how I kind of figure your book looks like. No, no, no. I have probably about 15 positions uh, that are like little spiker ones. No, I did that warrant stuff too. I did a lot of these commodity plays like during the great gold bull run of 2003 to eight. I mean, any pipe that someone did, we were just like, yeah, we'll, we'll be in for a hundred thousand units, you know, whatever. Yeah. And you know, we weren't shorting and we'd actually own them for the, for the four months and then we'd sell it the first day we could and we'd just keep the warrants. And, and I ended up getting like millions and millions of warrants in every single mining company in every country. Guess how many of them actually came into the money? <laughs> Not that many. Zero. <laughs> <laughs> we, we never exercised a warrant. Come on, really? <laughs> totally serious. Never <laughs> once. <laughs> 
That's funny. That's we uh, made some money on the we made some money on the common, but we never once exercised a warrant. Sometimes they went into money and we held on too long. Uh, we never yeah. once exercised a warrant. You're because you, you know what? You're a dreamer at heart. And for those, <laughs> for those who don't know, Cuppy's always going for the upside. He's always a believer that it's upside, and you're always like when we're chatting and and I'll say oh, I'm short the hey, market. But- he goes, I'm short too, and you'll talk about it and you'll be short for like ten minutes, and then you'll be like, but- oh, I can't take it anymore. But I, Kev, I can't short. Kev, you got to understand though. That's how Cuppy gets his ten baggers. Like you yeah. have to, you have to be willing to dream a little bit and give a chance for the thing. Because you, you are like you're up ten points and you're like I'm out. Like yeah. you, you, you can't ever have a ten bagger because you, you're, you're too quick on the trigger. <laughs> yeah. No, you're absolutely right. You're absolutely right, Patrick. There's no doubt about it. I, I'm gonna try to be more like Cuppy. That's gonna be my. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> Which means hold hold a, a whole hold bunch the words, of <laughs> watch them go deep in the money and then eventually expire worthless. <laughs> okay, listen, go. man, we're gonna let you go, Cuppy. Thanks so much for uh, for coming on the show. Why don't you tell people where they can find more and for them to watch for the St. Joe write up that you're gonna be coming out next week? Oh, you just gave me a homework project. Yeah, <laughs> I thought you told me you were gonna do it. <laughs> yeah, I'm gonna do it, but I didn't know if it's gonna be next week or not. Now I have homework. <laughs> <laughs> well, listen. Um, for those who listen to the show, it might not ever come, and you're ahead of the <laughs> you're ahead of it by listening to us on the show because uh, Cuppy might be so lazy that he never bothers writing it up. He's just going to tell us by verbally. So, where can they find you though? Because you should subscribe. It's a it's a great read, and as I said, you know, for those who are interested in ED trades, uh, they, make sure you follow him. So, where can they find you? Uh, it's at Adventures in Capitalism, and you can sign up, and uh, you'll get an email alert when I write something. And you know, it's, it's a free publication, so I only write when I feel like writing something. And okay. you know, there you go, Cuppy. Just a uh, one last note. Next week is our hundredth uh, episode, and well, you know, it was a big milestone. And you know, you're a part of this with your Cuppy's Corner, and we just wanted to thank you for for having joined us on this ride. Hey, appreciate it. I'm happy to be along for the ride. Yeah, it's it's a you're always a fan favorite, and uh, people whenever we miss it, we were actually thinking of having you on the hundredth, and then we realized that too many people are going to be upset that they missed the Cuppy's Corner this week. <laughs> <laughs> Honest to goodness, I, I we miss it, and I get I hear like, "Where's Cuppy's Corner? Where's Cuppy's Corner?" Right. Like it's like so I'm like, "Oh no, we got to keep him on his schedule because everyone's expecting him." <laughs> hey, at least I'm not on vacation this week. There That's you go. true. Actually, this is a very rare uh, episode where we're not calling Cuppy from a bar in the Florida South County. <laughs> now people understand that it was not really vacation, was it? It was work. It's all tax write-off. Yeah, it was. It was work. You were uh, checking out St. Joe's, and that's why you yeah, were there. All due diligence. Yep. Yeah. Oh, you know what? That's genius. Yeah, it's it's Cuppy is kind of the equivalent of you know when you're you're young and you decide to take a year off from university and you go tr- try to find yourself. So you go to Australia and you're not there. <laughs> so you go to New Zealand, you're definitely not there. So you check out Paris and you're still not there. And you spend the year traveling around looking for trying to find yourself. That's that's Cuppy. He just says <laughs> it with stocks. If you buy one uh, share of each country, it's all a write off. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. <laughs> all okay. right well thanks for joining right, us guys. take care sure thanks thing. Cuppy bye bye right, cheers right, cheers so Patrick it's my favorite time this week in trading history I got to sit back and listen to you weave your tale of wisdom what do you got for us wisdom is that what that is well I guess so <laughs> anyway <laughs> we're going back to October 3rd 2008 when George W. Bush signed into law the Troubled Asset Relief Program, also known as TARP, uh, as a part of that Emergency Economic Stabilization Act of 2008. So let's talk about this. So TARP was created and run by the U.S. Treasury to stabilize the country's financial system and mitigate foreclosures in the wake of that 2008 great financial crisis. And in a nutshell, The Treasury sought to buy all the toxic assets and equities foolishly held by some of America's biggest financial firms. This program was signed into law by George W. Bush on this very week back on October 3rd of 2008. 
as a part of the Emergency Economic Stabilization Act, which lasted for two years, ending October of 2000. And 10. Now, before we go on, we should note that the money uh, TARP uh, lent was eventually paid back to the government and they actually turned a profit. But let's talk about the story and, and what it meant. And so it was September 2008. Global credit markets came to a, a, a near standstill. The monstrous, too big to fail American financial st institutions like Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, AIG, were uh, on, ad, edging closer to the abyss. The uh, investment companies like Goldman Sachs and Morgan Stanley were, were even cha changed their charters to become commercial banks to weather the storm. In an attempt to stop the bleeding, the Treasury Secretary Henry Paulson pioneered the troubled asset relief program known as TARP. And so TARP's original purpose was to increase the liquidity of the money markets and secondary mortgage markets by purchasing the mortgage-backed securities, and uh, through that, reduce the potential losses of all the direct and indirect institutions that owned them. But the Treasury was allowed to purchase up to $700 billion, although that amount was amended to about $425 billion in the end. Essentially, the Treasury would buy up illiquid, difficult-to-value assets uh, on the secondary markets, that is the trader-to-trader, over-the-counter markets, and thus uh, allowing uh, participating institutions to stabilize their balance sheets and avoid further losses. And so I, I figured that we simplify this to a, a simple analogy of, remember when you were a kid, Kev, and you thought you could make a killing starting up that lemonade stand? Uh, well, you know, cut five hours later, you're uh, getting a sunburn on your lawn beside a, a, a table full of hot lemonade that it is abs absolutely no one is buying. So your mom is watching you out the window and she feels really bad for you. So she comes out and buys one cup of that tepid fly covered lemonade for 10 bucks and then says, wow, this hot, stinky lemonade is one of the uh, is, is just fantastic. I'll buy it all. So that's uh, that's a good way of uh, summarizing tarp. Did your mom enjoy that lemonade, by the way? <laughs> I, you know, I'm a Canadian, so I was selling beer. <laughs> so uh, here's how. And my mom drank it all, and she loved it. <laughs> <laughs> so let's how, let's talk about uh, how it broke down. So the first, the government bought 125 billion of preferred stock. Uh, obviously, preferred stock being higher up on the capital structure than the common stock of the eight. Uh, big banks. Uh, for this help, the banks were required to give the government a 5% dividend that would increase to 9% in 2013, encouraging the banks to buy back their, uh, those preferreds within five years. The government then spent $182 billion uh, on AIG, which gave AIG the money to pay the credit default swaps and avoid bankruptcy. For, uh, for the credit and housing, the Fed created a $20 billion term asset-backed security loan facility known as TELF and uh, loaned that money to their member banks who could give the credit to homeowners and businesses. They also provided $45 billion for home owner for closure assistance, although uh, only around $5 billion was used. The reason banks didn't touch the other $40 billion, you might ask? Well, they cherry-picked applicants and refused to help those that had lower to no equity. Of course, the hypocrisy is that these were the same banks who, just a few years before, were giving out ninja loans to anyone because they were making big money hand over fist uh, with every new mortgage. So finally, the government bought uh, $22 billion of toxic mortgage-related securities uh, that were essentially a write-off. It should be noted that uh, TARP demanded that these company, the companies involved lose their tax benefits and place caps on uh, executive compensation and forbade bonuses. Even so, by 2009, bailed-out firms paid some $20 billion to keep personnel uh, sardonically referred to as the TARP bonuses. So what's the TARP legacy? TARP uh, recovered funds of $441 billion from the $426 billion they invested, actually earning a, like a $15 billion profit while also saving the, the American auto industry. They stabilized the markets, and critics of TARP say that it rewarded bad behavior, sending a message to act irresponsibly and that they would be there to help out. But bankers still say the same thing now as they did back then, all hail the Fed put. <laughs> nice. I like that. 
Yeah, I mean, uh, you were around back then. Same with me. That was what cr- what uh, quite the crazy time, wasn't it? it? It really was. And you know what's what's strange, Patrick, is that after the dot com bubble, I thought to myself, "Oh, it's never going to get worse than this." This is like when it burst. I thought that's that's the craziest it's ever been. Then we had two thousand eight, and I thought to myself, "Oh, that's madness. We're never going to get a decline like that." <laughs> and then we get the vid the vid of two thousand twenty, and it's just like. Just as as we've talked about it before, uh, you know. I well, it was like the, cat- the the most rapid drop of the COVID. But the thing is, is that uh, the other two were much deeper, right? They cut much deeper, longer. Uh, I mean, there were companies that were down ninety percent off their highs when all everything was said and done, and so the COVID was was a nasty one. But it it was over pretty quick. Uh, and we'll see whether it's over. Actually, I don't even. That's know. That's true. You're right. Well, that's right, Patrick. Is so don't forget we're still in a bear market, according to you. Yeah. We uh, are. But uh, <laughs> I, I agree with you that the the 2008 slash or seven and eight it was it kind of lured you into thinking it was over, and then it just kept getting worse. You're you're absolutely right. Anyways, that's great. Thanks for sharing that with us today, Patrick. All right. Well, it's time for the WTF Clip of the Week, and it's time to invite Taylor on. Taylor, how you doing, buddy? Oh, I am just living the dream here. I'm drinking my uh, my beer in my uh, converted church Airbnb, just working remote. <laughs> it's the best, my man. So, yeah, you're not drinking uh, our uh, oatmeal brown ale. You said you ain't doing that shit. So, what, <laughs> what, what, what are you drinking? I'm drinking that Hawaiian punch beer I think you guys had a while ago, yeah. and I'm drinking it pinky up because I'm just a fancy guy. <laughs> there you go. All right, buddy. What do you have in store for us? So this week in uh, WTF, right, there's two things I love. I love Elon Musk, and I love the movie Super Troopers. Like Favre is the, the, the best. It's hilarious. And when Battery Day was going down, there was all this hype, and everyone was everyone was pumping it everywhere, and uh, and then you knew it was going to be a sell uh, on the day of. But anyway, I'm really proud of this mashup. I've been hearing some rumors that it's maybe one of the best, but I don't know. That's just what the word on the street is. I don't listen to that stuff. I just focus on what I do best, which is losing money in natural gas. So hit it, guys. <laughs> So you think it's an inherently risky move, that is, the battery plans, uh, with steep execution and operational challenges. Give me some sense as to what you're talking about there when you, when you reference those challenges. Reduce sales internally and basically bring in the battery supply chain internally. Um, it, 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 it's uh, a lot of risk. Emmanuel, you have a different view. Uh, I'm curious if you want to sort of rebut some of those concerns. Hell, we're about to get shut down anyway. I'd buy a $10 million car. I know you're a believer in, in a broader sense. Now, don't give me any lip. In a broader sense, you are. But, you know, a $382 billion market value at the beginning of trading today, and clearly the market believes that if you want to really try and say that there's any reflection of actual fundamental value over time here. Well, if you did, I'd activate my car's wings and fly away. <laughs> Well, I don't know if it's your best, but it's uh, it was definitely good here, buddy. That's uh, you know what? Uh, that's a that's a classic movie. Oh, it is. Oh, so I I haven't seen the second one because I don't want to, uh, you know, like I don't want to be disappointed. I just don't want to <laughs> watch it. Like I started watching Dumb and Dumber too, and I was like, whew, okay," and I turned it right off because uh, <laughs> wow, I don't want <laughs> I don't want to step away hero. from the TV. Step away from the TV. <laughs> Yeah, definitely. But All right. Listen, we got to before we go on. I got to know what's going on with Nat Gas. How are you losing money now on Nat Gas? Oh, here's the thing, right? Welcome to the I, club. I, I did a I did a, a great tweet. You know, I did this. I was did, doing the, my little analysis, and it's right up against a trend line. It looks like it's gonna pop, and I was like, everything in my body wants to go long on this thing. I was like, I'm gonna go short in a big way. Go short, <laughs> boom, pops down, and I was like, yeah, in the money. I'm like, you know what? I'm so good at this. I'm gonna do it right at the fib. And I'm going to ride that bounce back up and just bounces back up, eats me down. And I'm like, ah, I'm out. I was like, you know what? I'm going to get back in, get back in, Ugh, beats me again. And I'm like, I'm, I'm so done with this. It reminds me of trading Bitcoin. You just, they, they're so filthy. They just, they know it. They, and they well, read you 
The yeah. real problem was that you uh, had the right instincts at first when you went against every instinct that you had in your body. <laughs> <laughs> Much like George Costanza did. I'm a bald, middle-aged man living with my parents. You want to go out for a date. <laughs> and when you do that and you do the bizarro world, everything's fine. But then when you start to think you know something, that's, the, that's when you're in that's trouble. That's when it's good. Anyways, you know I'll take that and I'll report back next week on how I okay. do. And if I uh, make some profit, I'll split it with you. Okay, All sounds right. good. Thanks. Take care. Okay, it's time to move on, Kev. But we're going to invite Lena on for the no stupid questions. And uh, let's let's see what uh, what questions our listeners have for us this week, Kev. I don't even know if I can read the questions properly. This beer went straight to my head, actually. God, you finished um, it? I, well, I, almost. I, I, you must like it because I I'm sipping mine like it's uh, like it's warm. I'm on the third one. one. I don't know about you, but <laughs> we'll 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 get to beers at the end of the show. Okay, so tell us what um, we got here. Yeah. So the first listener, um, selling an in the money call is a better hedge than buying an out of the money put. Is this true, and why or why not? I know there are many variables that influence option prices, so it may be situational dependent. But could you comment? Patrick, I'll let you do this one just since you're the option expert. All right. Well, let's start off by just uh, saying that they're two very different trades. One of them, you're actually long gamma and the other, you're short gamma. And so a lot of people will say, well, listen, why wouldn't you just hedge the downside risk by selling an in-the-money call? You extract this intrinsic value to, and if the stock does decline – you didn't have uh, to pay. You actually got paid for act- uh, for s- uh, selling this call and collecting that premium. The problem is, is you have absolutely no upside, and you have all the left tail downside risk of the security. And so you are, in some way, I would always say, like, well, if you're going to sell a deep in the money call as a hedge, why don't you just even sell the stock? It's like, what's the point of being in it if you don't have the potential of making? upside potential on the stock. Uh, one situation where it did make sense to do that was I remember my uh, my boss back in the day uh, had a, a huge uh, whack of bank stocks that he got when when he joined the, the, the company and he had a zero cost base on it. So there was a massive tax consequence to selling this huge line of stock and at the same time didn't want to spend the big money buying the puts. And so the selling the deep in the money was a way for uh, for him to hedge out downside risk on something that had a huge t- tax consequence to unloading. And uh, but uh, I mean, un- unless there's a tax consideration or something like that, it's not a, a very good strategy in my mind. At least with a protective put, while it costs you money, you if you're right about the stock direction, you still have all of the upside of the stock, right? Do you have some? Is there, am I missing something, Kev? What, what's your no, take? I'll on just that? kind of. Briefly, sum it up it this way. When you sell the call, your loss is unlimited. And when you buy the put, your loss is limited to the premium you paid. So they are two distinctly different strategies. And one of them is earning the premium by taking that risk of the unlimited loss. And the other one is basically paying for someone else to take that risk. Yeah, so you're taking it, you're you're looking at it from that risk perspective, but it's also you have to note that with the protective put you have all of the upside of the stock and with the short call you have none of the upside, right? It's a, right. And they're completely different ways of hedging. With, uh, right. with and you're you're the scenario you're looking for uh, it's it's like there is always a right time and a wrong time for each strategy. Uh, but you just have to understand that they're not the same thing from a hedging perspective. Anyway, anyway next question. Next question is, what is the average number of trades you have on at any given time? And do you have a limit on the size for each of the trades? Five to 10%? Are right, you want to start, Kev? Yeah. <laughs> Why don't you start? I think yours will be a more traditional answer. Than well, sure. I mean, for me, uh, I actually, um, uh, let's start with sizing. I actually don't size my trades by uh, percentage of portfolio, but by the size of the risk. Uh, and so I, I risk adjust each trade. And because I use a lot of options in my strategies, uh, I usually am able to define my risk down to a very a specific number of what the absolute worst case scenario is. And so I, I so my trade sizing varies based, but my risk is actually very consistent. Um, and I usually am risking one to 2% 
of uh, my portfolio in one, any one trade. And, uh, and I have no fear of leveraging up and uh, having uh, positions that are, are, have a lot more leverage in the value of my portfolio, long as I can understand what the risk of each trade is. And that's, that's the way that I uh, approach it. So Patrick is bang on correct. And all the way I'll explain it is to say, if you think about the volatility of different positions, uh, you might have, let's say a Euro dollar futures contract that has a notional that is quite high when you look at the amount that you're trading in terms of notional amount, but in terms of the actual risk is quite low. So I might have a, a Euro dollar spread position that's two, three, four hundred percent of my portfolio, which sounds inc inc like insane until you realize that the amount that that's going to move around is a lot less than someone who might be short 10 percent of their portfolio in Tesla. Mm -hmm. And so that is the first thing to kind of understand is that you can't look at it as notional. You have to look at it as risk, or at least that's how I do it. And then the second thing is, as someone who does it for a living and does it full time, I'm probably different in that I will probably be more willing to go concentrated at specific times than most. And if I was running money professionally, like meaning if I was managing money on people's behalfs, then I would I would obviously have to not uh, I'd be more prudent. But as an individual or as a basically someone who trades for a sophisticated investors, we can be much more uh, kind of concentrated. So yeah. I will have things that are much higher than 10% of the portfolio, and uh, but that's not for everyone. Right. So right. one of the good things to think about is if you're going to lose, you make sure you don't have a loss that puts you out of the game, and that's the most important thing to realize. Patrick and exactly. I have talked about this numerous times, but you're going to end up having some bad trades. And if you have a string of them, you want to make sure that you're not having a string of them that is causing you a loss, whereas that you will be out of the game and not be able to trade anymore. Exactly. Anyways, hope that answers the questions. All right, Lena, is there anything else? Oh, I believe there was an additional question oh, from sorry. this listener asking for what is the favorite province to travel in Canada? Oh, for you, you, go. you want to go first? No, you go first again. I got to think about uh, it. I wasn't ready for yeah, this yeah, one. You know what? Um, for me, I would generalize it that you got to go either east or west. The coasts on either part of Canada are absolutely beautiful. And the more you move into the center of Canada, the shittier it gets. <laughs> And so, lo flat. long as it's long as you, long as you choose flat. east what, or west, hitting, hitting a low in Manitoba is that what you're yeah, trying to say, Patrick? There's that there's that joke that that is basically, uh, uh, you know, why do the trees lean in in Canada because Manitoba sucks. <laughs> He's told that joke twice now, maybe three times. <laughs> but, you know, it's so appropriate He's, right now. Yeah, but you just no, you set you know me what? up for it. I would I not know. have gone there. I would not have Okay, so that. listen, you got to pick a province. Go. Which one is it? Uh, I'll have to go with uh, BC. Uh, BC is a beautiful, like, uh, beautiful pro province. Uh, I actually like the interior just as much as I like the coastal. And I agree with Patrick that you probably end up having to do the coast. They're much more uh, pretty and stuff. Uh, I'll, uh, if I have to pick a province on the East Coast, I am going to go. I have to go Nova Scotia. I was going to go PEI, but PEI, I, I love the beaches. But after a while, the beaches kind of, they all seem the same. Nova Scotia has a little more variety. So I'm there going go. Nova Scotia. All right. There you go. All right. Uh, that's uh, And Lena, if they have any questions, where do they submit it? Listeners can submit their questions to no stupid questions at markethuddle.com. Perfect. Thanks, Lena. All right. Kev, it's time. It's time. Okay. Skin in the game. Let me uh, give the rules. And this time I'll read the rules properly since we've had some incidents around this. Skin in the game is a weekly opportunity for us, Patrick and I, to demonstrate that we are degenerate gamblers at heart. Every week, <laughs> one of us presents a wager and the other guy chooses which side of the bet he wants. Every wager needs to settle by next episode. And the currency for the wagers is as follows. A Duke and Duke, which is a $1, a one American dollar. Patrick likes to tell me all the time. A $1 bet. Then it goes up to a pint of beer, a burger bet, a pitcher, a case of beer, which is a 2-4 here in Canada. A bottle of wine with a $100 limit. No box wine for Patrick. And finally, a steak dinner. 
Okay, so the winner of the bet is ob obliged to create a new bet for the following week. Now, this is where we fell down because we were using the loser. It's the winner that has to make the new bet, and we're going to do this properly from now on. The other important thing is all wagers settle in full, and there will be no netting of positions. No netting of positions. Physical yeah. delivery, like in the futures market. Oh, yeah. This, all... Well, no. This is like before they cleared swaps, and there was no netting of positions, which yeah. caused basically the great financial crisis because there was no netting of positions. Well, we're going to create the great uh, financial, or not the great financial, the great booze crisis of the market huddle by making no netting of positions. So that That's means right. if we win four pitchers of beer, there needs to be pitch payment of four pitchers of beer. So if it's like four to three, that means seven will be drunk total. Okay. Oh my God. We have so to let's start, get on. We have to let's... start banging these off, right? Like, yeah. Because otherwise, it's going to build up too big. Yeah. Anyway. Okay. So, so let's listen. talk about our bet last week. Oh, you you yeah. go ahead, Patrick. Well, and no, I, I'm too embarrassed. <laughs> <I> just... <laughs> <laughs> you know, you were so sure that I was winning. No. And, and so then, I, then you, I knew. Then, going and then you looked. And yeah. then you looked. <laughs> no. So I thought. I thought I was. I thought I was looking good till this morning with the vid with the. Trump having the vid, and I thought, oh, I'm going to lose because the market's blowing out. And uh, the the bet was as follows. I'll re read it for those that are don't aren't watching it on the YouTube. Will the OAS option adjusted spread U.S. high yield broad credit spread be higher or lower than plus 547 basis points on Friday? Okay, so Patrick gave me that, and obviously I chose tighter because you know I'm Patrick's always trying to get me to be bearish, and I'm like, no, I'm going to be bullish. So I chose tighter, and it was looking good all week. And then I thought today it would blow out, and sure enough, nope, I'm good. So that's five hundred thirty-six basis points. You, so that's uh, snuck you flipped it in. eleven points. You snuck it in this there. This is a hat trick for you. Hat oh trick for God. me. So I, I did have uh, one of my uh, one of our listeners notice that there's no such thing as triple tops. So I'm probably going to lose this one. <laughs> well, you just had three wins. Yeah. Oh yeah, but maybe. Oh, that's right. So maybe I, I'm destined to win four. I don't know. I don't know how I'm going to work that. There's no such thing as triple tops into this. But let me give you my bet, okay? All right. So for those who don't know, we actually, Patrick doesn't know it. I have uh, I made it up on the spot. Just... I'll tell you the truth. I was doing it while he was doing his market history because I get bored during that section. Um, <laughs> so <laughs> we're going to talk about uh, the December contract of the copper future. So pull up a okay. chart. Yeah, yeah, I'm doing that right now. I have December. A yeah, December Christmas. That's how the that's how when you're a real futures yeah, yeah. guy, you call you call you say Christmas copper. All right. Okay. Christmas copper. Two ninety eight. Yeah. Two ninety eight. Okay. So here's what I'm gonna and this is it has to settle by next week. I'm gonna make ours a little more exciting. It's gonna be a one touch. And for those who I present it, this the trade, and then Patrick gets to pick what side he's gonna be on. Okay. So it's whether the December contract Next week will hit and touch three oh nine ten. So, so you 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 saying touch up here to three oh nine ten. So you can choose yes it'll touch that or no it won't. It won't. Ah, oh, nice. It won't right here. Yep. The, I drew the line right here. It won't. Okay, well that was easy. Okay, now we got to do our bet. Pull up the uh, starts as a Duke and Duke. So now it's my turn to. I'll, I'm going right to a pint of beer. I'll do the burger. You're going the. I'm going a pitcher. Oh, let's leave it at a pitcher. Aren't we always doing pitchers though? Come on. No, no, I, I, I'm not ready for a two four yet. <laughs> He's feeling a little gun shy because there's been a lot of uh, settlements the other way. Wait a second. So what? Wait, 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 pitcher. We're just going up to a two four. What, what, what kind of a two four are we doing? Are we doing like the tall cans of the premium shit? Like, are we talking no, like no. a seventy dollar case? No, no. Or am I delivering you some Molson Canadian? Yeah, you can deliver Molson Canadian. Well, you get to pick though, don't you? Well, I don't know. We haven't said the rules yet. Lena, get on. What do you think? We should, should also include the keg in here. We haven't. Oh no, I, I don't that's know. a lot of beer to drink, Lena. <laughs> that's a lot of beer. Yeah. I think it should be tall boys. Tall okay. boy, Lena's, Lena's called it. Tall boy, forget it. I'm in. I'm in. Forget. Uh, let's take it to a case of beer. Okay, we're done. Case of beer. Oh, December you know contract, uh, hitting that three oh uh, nine three spot ten. zero nine ten. So if it hits okay. nine ten, I get my case of beer. Okay. 
Sounds good. You're on. This is a good one. All right. I, you know, you, I hope you feel good about this. Why? Wait, do, do you have to drink the whole case of beer in one No, 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 no. That's We're going to no, have a party. Is, no, no, this is... All right. I don't have to share if I win. If he, if he gives me the case of beer, I can share with whoever I want. Okay. <laughs> the pitcher has to... No, anyway. All right, listen. It was a good bet. Let's see what happens. I like it. All right. Okay, thanks for tuning in to The Market Huddle. We appreciate you spending time with us. Please give us a follow at The Market Huddle on Twitter. We're there every day. Lena's in charge. Give her a shout out. She gets tired of talking to Patrick and I. You can listen to The Market Huddle on all the networks, Google Podcasts, Podbean, Spotify, Android Play, iTunes, and YouTube. A lot of people watch on YouTube to see all of our charts and visuals. And while you're there, please like and subscribe to get our latest content. And please, if you could, rate us on iTunes. I know it's a dumb game, but it makes a difference to Apple's algorithms, and it helps us out immensely. Patrick, where can they find you? You can find me on Twitter, at Patrick Ceresna, and uh, you can find me on my, on my website, bigpicturetrading.com. Kev, where can they find you? On Twitter, it's at Kevin Muir, M-U-I-R, or you can go check out my newsletter at themacrotourist.substack.com. And listen, we can never have too many friends, a bear market, bull market. We're just happy to spend the time together on this crazy ride. So thanks for tuning in. Now stick around for the after show. All right. Another show in the bag. That was a little longer than... We kept a little tighter, didn't we, Lena? Yeah. Yeah, that was actually pretty okay. tight. Lena, did you really impressed. drink your beer? Yes, I did. <laughs> I like. I actually, I wasn't even kidding when I said I don't even know if I can read it properly. I was like, oh, wait a minute, I'm feeling pretty. This this, this gets a new record for the least amount I've drank, and I, I'm not, I'm just gonna say it. It's undrinkable. What? Yeah, you I'm like actually, it? I I I'm on my third can. No. <laughs> <laughs> If it's got alcohol in it, Patrick yeah. will drink it. I, I don't know. I must not like the brown ale. No. It's it's a heavier heavier beer. I, yeah, but it's like not it's the heavy. Stronger it's tasting beer. Bitter and it's just like oh my god. I don't know. It almost tasted like I was drinking coffee and beer exactly. at the same yeah. time. Like almost like yeah. a lighter Guinness, maybe. A lighter. Like that sort of a lighter Ooh. Guinness. Yeah. I can drink all the Guinness in the world, and I can't drink one of these. Okay, I'm gonna just get it out of the way and quit, quit talking before we lose uh, more beer people, but. Uh, Four three for my. Oh. No. That's our record low, I think. No, it's not. He's gone lower. <laughs> he has. He has. A... Patrick, what do you think about the beer? You know what? Uh, I, I wouldn't. This is not my style of beer, but I was enjoying it. I'm not gonna shit on it like he is, but I'm not gonna give it a great score either. Out of the seven one. Seven oh, one. Okay. I think that the oxygen from Patrick's mask is not getting to his brain or something. <laughs> <laughs> got his mask on too tight or something. I don't know what's going on. <laughs> Galena, what do you got? Um, I didn't hate it. I mean, obviously, I finished it. Um, I kind of chugged it, I think. Um, I would give it a 7.6. Uh, nice. I'll, I'll be kind nice. to you. Yours is... No, uh, nice. No, no, see... You were shitting all over me, but you're being nice to her, which of is de- just demonstrating to everybody that you're just biased. Yeah, it's uh, yeah. Or maybe I'm trying to avoid my career risk here, yeah. <laughs> siding with my boss, my boss over here. That's true. You know? And Taylor, your Hawaiian your punch drink. or whatever you're drinking. My Hawaiian punch. Yeah, it's it's. I don't. It's just gonna sound gross, but it tastes creamy. Oh it's God, it does. Strange. You it's should stop. Strange. It's- yeah. Yeah, it's Hawaiian punch, but it tastes. Good. And, and you know it what? Was actually yeah. good. they don't go. Taylor's doing this from a church, and it sounds like God's talking to us, telling us his, <laughs> his ear is creamy. <laughs> uh, no, it's coming to me. He gave he he gave me some. Oh, he says uh, go long that gas. Okay, okay, great, good. Hopefully, this is a tip I can use. Um, no, it's great here, and nice. it's creamy beers. So I give it a uh, six. <laughs> there it is. Another rookie score. Another rookie score. <laughs> All right. We're still learning about scoring. There you go. Oh. But can we talk about what we watched this week? I know what I watched this week, and I'm dying to talk okay, about so it. Okay, so go ahead, Lena. Um, you, so I think I mentioned last week, and this is the reason why we didn't have a WTF clip last week, was because I was moving last weekend. Yep. And we're still in process of unpacking, but we decided to install the TV right away because I did not want to miss the debate. Okay. The U.S. election debate. What and debate? I had to. 
<laughs> what debate? <laughs> <laughs> um, I had to turn it off halfway through because I could not listen to it anymore. It was so cringeworthy. I don't know what you guys thought. I don't know if you guys watched it. Oh, Lena, you're going to get us in trouble. Oh, We're not. <laughs> no, I mean, it was. I'm not asking you to side with anyone. I just think the whole debate process was just really messy. I actually didn't watch you know? it, and I'm not. I'm not being sarcastic. I think I was writing one of my my macro tourist piece, <laughs> and it wasn't even about the debate. I, I don't know. I just I. Patrick, did you watch it? Uh, I uh, didn't watch it in its entirety, uh, but I did watch uh, it. Uh, it was just a gloves off. You know, I'm actually looking forward to the vice president debate. I don't know if they're going to have them. No. Did they do I, that? <laughs> Taylor, yes, they I, do. I, I thought they were. <laughs> I, I, I'm, I far more, I'm far more interested in listening to them to go at it. Uh, I think them too. It'll, uh, it'll, it'll be – no, but it'll, I think it will be far more an intellectual debate. I personally think if if you uh, anyway, I personally I don't know I'm, how I'm, not, is... I'm, I'm trying not to dig myself into any hole, so I'm not going to yeah. comment on it. Uh, but uh, I think what I'll tell you is I actually was not by, surprised. Everyone came out to, was like I had friends that were telling me, "Oh my God, did you see?" Her? And can you believe you said that? I'm like, no, actually, no. This is exactly what I was expecting to happen. Uh, it, it was uh, it was so predictable that it was just going to be a shit show. Everyone knew it was going to be a shit show, and then everyone surprised it was a shit show. Yeah, I'm going to change the topic so we don't get into yeah. any trouble with. <laughs> yeah, that. agreed. Go for I'm it. I'm going to. I I I'm watching something new. One of my buddies uh, recommended it. I had tried it, and the first episode was so bad I gave up on it. And then he w- he kept raving about it, and I was like, oh, I got to hang in there, I guess. And I have now become a fan. It's Ken Lasso. Do you guys okay. know this? Nope. Oh, my God. No. Is that like no. a radio personality turned into a TV show? No, it's this. Um, it's on Google, It's on Apple. Apple TV. Okay. And let me just look what the... Uh, uh, what I can't remember. It's this Michael... Uh, I don't know what his name is. Here, wait. It's not Ken. It's Ted. I'm a complete no- m- knob. Ted Lasso? Yeah, sorry. So, Jason Sudeikis is the main guy. And it's about a football coach that goes to England. <gasps> oh, I heard about this. Yeah. I heard about this. And it's actually, uh, if you're going to give it a whirl, give it more than one episode. That's my that's my recommendation. Because right. the first, epi- like Sudeikis, the first so. episode wasn't very good, but it got better as it went along. And I actually, I, I've, I've actually hit the point. And not only that, the interesting thing about it is they don't release it all at once. I don't know. This is Apple. They, they just, they want to do it like regular TV. So it's. Uh, I have to actually. I just got notification while we were doing this that the, <laughs> that the, the new ki- Ted Lasso is on my TV. But now, and if the so new I'm episode be comes you out, so early. but so listen. But if the new episode comes out, you can still. They keep all of the past episodes yeah. there, so yeah. someone can still go binge watch. Yeah, that's right. Up, right. Yeah. Okay. But anyways, it's pretty funny. It's good. It's funny like, that I don't even know that. Well, I, I understand. <laughs> Patrick, you haven't turned on TV, and oh, we should ask no. Patrick. Did you watch anything? No, else? I have not. No, sorry. What did you? I watched. <laughs> I watched the debate. That's about it. Really? Yeah, I'm. Pa- you didn't even finish watching I it didn't either. Even so do that. What did you my do? attention span is that low. Okay, so I will give you my other piece of news. So remember this summer when I broke my hand mountain biking? Yes. Yes. And my son and I have been going back to that hill, and getting the courage to get up and try it again and do it. Actually, there's a bigger hill than the one I broke my hand on. I broke my hand on like the little baby one, but anyways. Um, <laughs> you don't admit that. You, yeah. you, you don't admit does that wife, on there. Does your wife listen to this podcast? No, not a chance. Uh, you broke your hand on the small hill, and then you're going to go back to the bigger hill. <laughs> <laughs> Dude, my, yeah, okay. We, okay, we have now mastered it. We don't even hesitate. We just fly over this bad boy, and I'm we're both so proud of ourselves. I know. Oh, can we get oh, a video? For no, next it's week? embarrassing because it's not that big a deal. Like true mountain bikers would go, "You guys are wimps." This is I can't believe you broke your hand on that. But for me, it was pretty scary, and I'm now just flying over. It's really good. I'm getting in shape. I'm feeling good. Oh yeah, it's great. Yeah, that's You're awesome. getting in shape during COVID. That's uh, that's a milestone. That's good. Yeah, good for you. It's uh, and he's he's 15, so I suck a lot of wind trying to keep up with him at certain points. But uh, 
You know, it's funny because he's not quite as strong. So sometimes on the big uphills, like he gets into trouble, and uh, oh. I can power through some things. But on the whole, usually I like him. And then he's kind of dumb on the downhill parts. There's like really long downhills, and I'm not quite as brave as him or stupid. And uh, <laughs> and he goes faster than me, so we can't tell the, the my wife about that part. But anyway, otherwise well, it's young correct. and young and invincible, young yeah. and invincible. Well, we right? should touch wood. Anyway, so that's my big excitement. Nothing else really exciting happened. All right. How about you, Taylor? How long are you in the church? You know, I'm in here for the next month. And let me tell really? you, I, you know, I, re- I really, I really respect you guys, and I really like you guys. And I'm sitting here, and every, every, you know, I have these little jokes that I want to throw in, but I'm like, I can't, man. I love these guys too much. They're too smart. What do I know? You know, I haven't made money in any of these natural gas. I don't want to touch on natural gas again, but I just really respect you guys. Um, you know what? Oh my gosh, this is the beer talking. This is totally the beer talking. <laughs> <laughs> I love you guys. Uh, I've been watching. <laughs> Yeah. I love you, you know, you know, during during this week in trading history, Taylor messaged me and was like, "Is it just me, or is Patrick actually speaking really clearly this time?" <laughs> I said, "I was just gonna be, I was just gonna say the same thing. I think he's just a little drunk. He's a little drunk, and just a little drunk." Oh, Patrick's so, getting better at it. I mean, oh yeah, it's God. like when you're. Uh, thanks, you, guys. You can actually hold your. Guys, thanks. <laughs> you can hold your breath a lot longer when you're drunk. Have you ever gone swimming drunk? You're like, I can hold my breath forever down here. <laughs> Um, that's what I found anyway. I, I've been looking for, I've been watching a lot of 30 Rock this this week, but I've been, uh, which is great, smart show, love it, hilarious, show businessy because my wife's in showbiz. But I've been waiting to watch The Servant uh, on Apple TV, but we don't have Apple TV. The what? But now we do because we're at an Airbnb. The Servant on um, uh, Apple TV, which is like a horror TV show. I've been yeah. hearing. Who's in it? Ugh. Oh, I didn't know about uh, this. Nobody I would know. Lauren Ambrose. No, so nobody. Uh, M. Night, no, it's M. Night Shyamalan. Shyamalan. Uh, um, right. Yeah. So, pretty exciting. Well, I don't know uh, this. It, okay, well, I haven't seen it, so I'm just bringing it up in case you guys uh, know more than me. Ron Weasley's in it. <laughs> <laughs> Gotta watch it now. Ron Weasley's in it. <laughs> <laughs> Ron Weasley's in it. You gotta watch it. That's funny. There's no magic. I'd actually like to be though. known as forever as Ron Weasley. I know he probably made enough that's probably worth it. I'll be known as Ron Weasley. <laughs> yeah, he's laughing now. I'm sure. Yeah. It's pretty awesome, actually, being known as Ron. Yeah. You know, what's the other guy? Uh, Harry Potter. He must go around everywhere, and like he's just always known as Harry Potter. It's like James Paul. Actually, he tried to claim it back because he did live theater in England where he got naked on stage. Yeah, I, I saw think that's that. what his his. Oh, you yeah, saw it. You right. went and saw it. No, no, oh, I did. Interesting. I, 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 <laughs> no, I'm not. I'm not really interested in that. But that's that's great. Good for you, Kev. I'm glad. <laughs> okay, we went. No, there. I have no problem. Great. I have no problem. Great. It's, it's Patrick that usually has the problems with the with those jokes. Oh, that's true. That's it's true. Jokes. I have no that's problems with my jokes. <laughs> it was a joke. Your jokes are so great. I love my own jokes. <laughs> Oh, oh well. Anyways, okay. So next week, a hundred. We got to think up something good to do. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Stay tuned, everybody. Yeah. Guys, Episode I've already got 100. something in the works. It's gonna be, it's gonna be good. The one hundred. I'm really coming all out. Oh, oh you have blazing. to do it. You have to do a great uh, WTF. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. you want another nope. another video? No pressure. Yeah, I think <laughs> another video oh. might be appropriate. Oh, okay. I'll do one this week. Okay. <laughs> Let's do it. <laughs> All okay, right. so All right, let's uh, tap out, boys. Now. Well, before we go, I just want to know, um, Lena and Taylor, who do you think? Do you think Patrick's going to win this week? Um, I think he is. I actually, I am inclined to say I think yes. He's going to win this week. <laughs> I have this bad feeling about it. Oh my God! Stop this! You know, you know what? You're uh, just, you're just. No, you know why up. I have a, I, well, you know why I have a bad feeling? Because I bet bigger. I should have left it lower. I have a you feeling. You were cocky. I, I have a feeling that God, the gods are going to punish me for that. I'm just, I'm looking at it and it's like the one touch, that's the key. Like just looking at it, you know, the top of the wicks are just at 309.10. And I'm like, is, you know, what does Kevin know that I don't? And I know it's most things, but <laughs> it's like, you know, he might. I don't think so, though. I don't even think it, I don't even think it's going to get above 
three oh three oh eight. Stop uh, jinxing it, dude. Just nice. stop. Okay. Don't say anything else. You <laughs> are done. Patrick really needs a win. <laughs> no, no more uh, goochering the trades. Yeah. Everyone just stop talking about. You this. got George Costanza before he realized that he should be doing Bizarro World, telling you that you're gonna win, Patrick. <laughs> I've never felt yeah. better about a trade in my life, folks. That's so crazy. <laughs> I would say no. I'm saying I'm saying I'm pa I'm on Patrick's side here, and I'm real oh, sorry, Patrick. Nice. But I'll I'll buy you uh, uh, or I'll eat some of those fries of the beer or the burger, oh, or you whatever you guys bet on. Uh, two I mean, four. I'll there. give you a can. It's two four. Okay. okay. Well, well, that is. Thank Thanks you. for tuning in. Check in next week for our hundredth show. It should be a lot of fun. Thanks for sticking with us. Take care, everybody. Take care, everyone.